All right. <laughs> so I, I think we are actually starting this presentation because otherwise we're really going to run late. Um, hello, I'm Chita. I'm the director of uh, the European Pulpit Show. And uh, since we have to run it at this time of the day, which is really, really late um, uh, by European standards, so um, uh, I hope that everyone's awake. I'm, I'm very thankful that people are coming interested in the stuff we do. And um, when we uh, when we started uh, preparing this talk, um, uh, we we thought, how can we present what we do? Because honestly, we've been doing this for more than ten years, but um, we had no idea how we actually do it. We never had a structure to the process. It was basically um, it was basically tasks that were handed to the people who were there. And uh, it kept growing from there, so everybody became bigger and bigger tasks. And uh, before we prepared this um, this talk, um, we tried to make like a little diagram that you should be able to see over there. Um, would you please uh, turn down the house lights, so maybe, and and close the curtains. You down there, the the guy with the remote that we now have. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> So that people that people can see the projection properly. No. They have a great right remote. They have no idea where they're pointing. I love that. This is this is how the pop show goes. It's like you have the right button to press, and nothing happens, and then keep like three hours finding out why it doesn't work that way. Did it work earlier? Yeah. <laughs> okay, as long as you can see what I'm talking about. So I'm not going to explain that diagram because. Um, we started preparing this talk, and this was the first question we asked ourselves. So where do we even start? Because we didn't know. So, so we made this little process diagram, and we figured out that whatever we do, it's fucking complicated. So um, th there's a lot of uh, stuff we're not going to talk about tonight, um, simply because uh, it, it would take too long. And um, uh, you will, you will, you will. We will be yeah, concentrating on the stuff that we thought is interesting. Um, the whole thing, the whole production of the puppet show starts a long time before we actually start rehearsing the puppet show, obviously. You can see, uh, I, I made a screenshot from, from our internal documentation where you can see that actually the first script writing meetings take place in January. And uh, the whole process of actually making this happen takes about between seven and eight months. And um, um, Does your microphone work? There it is. Okay. <laughs> Yep. Okay. okay, I have no idea which microphone you are, but we were trying our best. <laughs> and um, well, as you can see, we start uh, with the, with the script writing, um, and uh, because this thing first needs to be written, and um, yeah, um, come upstairs. <laughs> Just sit down. I'm going to tell you the full story. We probably need to change. Some cards in the middle because uh, it decides it wants to like auto detect this thing and it doesn't work. But uh, the difference is I have to shut down one thing and stop the other. It's kind of <laughs> And well, basically, this half year is all the time we have. Uh, we have uh, basically one. One. Uh, he always does that. Uh, <laughs> we have one year of, of preparing uh, this thing and January is about the time when we actually get to do it. And we have only this one uh, go to actually get it right. You start writing it, sometimes it's going to be, uh, sometimes it's going to work. And uh, if we figure out it doesn't work, we have to make it work. But this is, by the way, if, if we talk about script writing meeting, that's usually me and I folks. And um, <laughs> we are living about 500 kilometers, that's 350 miles apart. That means uh, if the roads are clear, we have like a, I think, a, uh, what's the record? Uh, four hours. Um, yes, I usually take like six hours per time. I'm not young as he is. And uh, I, had a good I don't want to die that early. <laughs> And so it's quite quite a bit of an effort because uh, every second weekend he comes to my place and every other weekend I come to his place, and we somehow try to not to die or like uh, be bankrupt or anything like that. Or kill anyone around us. Yes. Um, so obviously, um, where's that thing? I thought there was okay. Uh, Oh, there it is. Yeah, I need to look at my at my own notes at the moment uh, because, uh, as a matter of fact, we are kind of karaoke this thing. 
<laughs> okay, when we first we we need to come up with ideas with um with uh, what the heck are we doing? Thank you. <laughs> And uh, the first thing we come up with, what kind of story do we want to write? Because that's the first idea uh, that, that we need to come up with. Is it going to be a love story? Is it going to be like a political thriller? Is it going to be a, is it going to be a, a science fiction story? And um, we usually settle with something that we really enjoy writing. Because we get a lot of requests, why don't you write this, why don't you write that, why don't you write something that goes with the theme? If you only have six months to write it, and uh, you're not someone who basically writes pulp fiction for a uh, living. It's really hard to come up with something that someone else came up with and then write a story that, that fixes it. And uh, so we usually go with epic stories. Uh, we like character-driven storytelling because it's, it sounds very sophisticated, but it's actually easier to write. And uh, we like to do like um, fables for adults. That's the stuff we like to write. And um, yeah, obviously uh, the, 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 the inspiration we have is uh, basically the stuff we wanted to watch when we were children. Uh, so a lot of inspiration we draw are from um, early 80s or 90s, like Jim Henson movies with all of the Dark Crystal or anything like that. And uh, the other thing is we would really like to play computer games. So um, we, are, we are much inspired by computer games of the 90s and the story they tell. Like uh, you can see that last year's um, story was very much inspired by uh, Inherit the Earth. And um, well, next thing you have to find out if you know what kind of story you want to write, you need to find out when and where is it going to happen. You need to come up with the universe that takes place then. So you have to make up a time frame. If it's if it's supposed to be like a mirror image of the real world, you have to see is it the medieval times, is it far in the future, and you need to come up with um, you need to come up with a place. And one of the things that many story writers don't do, but, but that we are completely like OCD about, is that we must have a geography that works. For example, if characters move from one place to another, we we need to make sure. <laughs> yeah, we need to. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need not only to make sure that uh, it works on stage, but also uh, if they walk like for two days to cover the difference, actually the story must take that into account. And uh, the, the graphic you're, you're seeing right now, uh, that is part actually of the opening title, because we put it in the opening title, like Lord of the Rings, like, because we wanted to give people the idea that we are telling fantasy stories, that's why we have this kind of map. But the other thing is also, is that the, the the um, distances we have here and the scale of the world kind of matches our story, so we can actually can tell a story in this time and place. And um, oh, I will I will stay on this thing for a little bit because uh, the, the next thing is um, you need to come up with characters who live in this place that you've just come up with, and um, you you come uh, up with the idea what is. Uh, what is the main characters? What is the main conflict? What's the story going to be about? So you come up with, okay, you have this one guy and he has to redeem himself because he has a dark secret. And you keep writing that guy's backstory and it's not going to end up directly in the story, but it's just the pre-work you do before you start writing this. So you know this, this guy is living alone and he once had a wife. And just die, and he and she died, and he thinks he's responsible for it. So she, he wants to redeem himself. So he has a strong motivation to do certain things. And then we have that other guy who uh, has a lot of power because he is like part of the ruling uh, of the ruling caste, and uh, he has all that powerful machinery uh, behind him, and uh, he's trying to protect it. So he has a very strong personal motivation to do what he's been taught that is right to do. And uh, then we have the third person who might be running away from home because she's a fugitive. Um, because uh, she's an unwanted child and she has like genetic properties that are not wanted in that kind of uh, society. And you, so you start writing um, the, 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 the backstory of the characters and then you basically, if you have the world, the characters and the motivation, you basically imagine how would it be if these characters meet and you start writing the dialogue. And if you reach that point, and if you've done it consistently, the story is basically going to write itself. We don't always <laughs> make it that idea. Yes, yeah, yeah, sometimes they, they do things that are yeah. uh, basically 
not as not so good for a show because then they start stabbing each other right in the first scene. It's not good. Uh, you you don't want to have the characters uh, going at each other's throat right at the beginning and killing each other. Yeah, because that would be a very uh, short. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, exactly. So what we try is to place them in the world and say, okay, go. Yeah, and they, and they run. So in our head, they start running and doing things. And uh, if that outcome is not really uh, as desired, then we put an obstacle in, the, in their place. So they can't run that way. They have to run the other way. And so like this, you build yeah. uh, piece by piece. And as you can tell, the actual mechanics of playing comes last. Um, we have to keep in mind what the restrictions are and what people can do and what people we have. Because we are writing for a specific group of puppeteers that we can't write something on. We don't have, and we can't write. Uh, we can't write anything that we physically can't do. Anyway, um, how do we come up with the stuff? <laughs> it is basically I'm showing you right now the road that we usually walk. Right. This is this is my place. I'm living. I'm living someplace down here. Yeah, that's my home. <laughs> And this is the way we walk. There's like a camel park here. And uh, when the weather is nice, we keep walking for like two or three hours and basically keep throwing ideas at each other and um, to get all the distractions out of you. Because if you sit at the computer and we're trying, out, uh, we're trying to come up with ideas, we will be totally distracted and watch Twitter and be frustrated. But just coming outside and having a walk and like this, this is roughly like 15 kilometers. Um, this is the best way to come up with ideas. And when we actually start writing, um, we do a lot of collaboration. It is a very intense thing that basically Icebox and me have uh, kind of, well, how do you say, developed over the years. So um, first thing we do is just write the dialogue from top to bottom. And we're using this uh, pirate pad thing, which is, uh, as, does anybody of you uh, know pirate pad or etherpad? Some people do. It's a little bit like Google Docs. It's a it's a website that many people can log in at the same time, and you can see the um, you can see the names on the top right. It's right now just me, and um, several people can edit and watch the same document being edited. So you can basically log into this, and if there's like log in three people, you see three names, and everyone writes in a different color. So um, we sit together. And we keep throwing line at, lines at each other, and one of us starts writing this. And at some point, you get into the flow, and the person who's actually doing the writing will just keep writing. And the other person will just basically edit all the errors out, just a few lines them up. <laughs> and uh, in the end, we get some German-English mixture thing that we can work with. When, when we've got like the basic dialogue done, we put it into our internal document, uh, documentation, which is a wiki. And uh, we, we first write a header into the wiki, what you can see right now, uh, we, where we have a list of characters, we have a list of the setting, how the scene is going to be. Basically, you can read it as a, as a novel, because you know where it is, when it is, who's in it, and stuff like that. And we actually put uh, our dialogue and our actual directions that we come with, uh, up with into the wiki. It, it's, a, it's a developing thing. Uh, you can see the little symbols on the left. It, uh, it shows which is the direction, which is the light direction, which is the sound direction. And uh, using this, people can theoretically uh, just pick up the lines that are interesting for them. And then, uh, as you can see in, uh, on, the, on the bottom, um, oh, sorry, um, the actual dialogue follows. That's how we document internally. So we have a collaborative writing process, and then uh, we put it in the wiki, and uh, then we have a more iterative process where everyone involved like, can do their own edits, like the sound guy does sound edits, or that guy can do the light edits, and so on. Yes, and we keep changing it all the time, so it has a version control so you can see what it actually does. Well then, eventually magic happens, and uh, the result is a script, and uh, the exact process, how we get there, can be wider difference. This is, this is how a typical pop show script looks like. It has like Roughly 70 pages uh, with all the directions um, in it. It's basically a printout for, from the wiki. Everyone gets a copy of this for each rehearsal we do. Some uh, decide to put it on their handheld, they put it on the phone or on the tablet. But um, for most of the, of the rehearsal we do this. And uh, everyone during the rehearsals like this just scribbles in it and have their own notes. And uh, well, but most of the time, Risa is the one who has to consolidate all the changes because uh, she's our script kitty, <laughs> and uh, we just keep keep her throwing changes at her, and she will put them in the wiki when when time has come. So um, I will go 
I, I will try to go fast. If you want an explanation, please yell, stop! But we only have like uh, two and a half hours for this event, and so I'm going to try to be a little bit faster so that once we don't overdraw on time stop. When we've got the basic dialogue written and the basic direction, it's really only basic, there's a lot of stuff missing yet, Th then comes the time when the first rehearsal takes place. We, uh, we used to have like, um, like a workshop that we can use as a rehearsal stage. I will show you more about that later. And uh, as you can see the pictures, this is how it looks when we sit for, for, together for the first time. Ideally, everyone should have read the script by then, but many don't. <laughs> they want to, don't want to spoil the surprise. <laughs> We're like, no, we don't like surprises at the first rehearsal. And um, this, this is this is this is the time uh, when we um, when we first do the casting, and this is the first time uh, when we first read it. It's very very. Very exciting because yeah. the first time uh, when we see that the stuff we wrote actually works, <laughs> if we start reading out the, the dialogue where, uh, like, he's going to do a line, I'm going to do a line, and uh, we're trying to find out who of the guys you can see there, uh, guys and gals actually, you can see them, uh, will be able to play this role or play that role. And someone says, Oh, I want this role, oh, I want that role. And then, of course, training goes on. And someone, uh, there are two, two or three people who want to take one role, and the other ones want to take another role, and then they start swapping things until we finally arrive at, uh, at the stage where we can say, okay, you are, in this case, you are uh, Frostwind, you are Ironwood, and uh, you are Riverstone. And that's how we try to settle down at the first meeting, the first script meeting. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Concerning the casting, which, uh, who speaks which role and who plays which role, sometimes we have someone in mind, yeah. sometimes we have to have someone in mind, like we have very, very few female actors, uh, so if we have like one woman, like, uh, like uh, one woman like, uh, like Pan in the cast, it's quite obvious that she's going to play the girl, because there's no choice. <laughs> Uh, sometimes we sometimes we cast by skill because someone has a speaking role and we know his English is really good. And sometimes we know someone will play an extra because he does play very good, but his English is not too good. And since we're doing all this in a secret, uh, in a secret language, hey, in a foreign <laughs> language, it sometimes does be like a secret language to us. Um, we add that extra level of difficulty. Um, when we write, we actually have editors. So we usually have people like Lancy Chicago or Pinky or Twill uh, trying to help us out and read through our script before we rehearse it and turn the gibberish into some what English-like sentences. Because yeah, it's it's really hard as Germans to actually write as in English. So yeah, when we reach this point, um, we basically go and rehearse the thing. Basically, everyone knows who their roles is. And the first thing we do is we read this whole thing from the script with the right distribution of roles. And I have usually the pens out actually changing and doing stuff because it makes such a big difference if you hear something like played or if you're just reading it from the script. And, and um, you the first time you read Yeah, and we read on the cable. Then we wiggle it again. <laughs> the first time reading and uh, standing behind the stage and trying to play the thing is usually very, very uh, stiff. And it just goes like, um, yeah, uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, okay, got the line. Okay, ouch, damn. Uh, oh, no, no, they're not the fire. No, uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, we're not going to have some footage on the first yes. person, so we can have your own opinion on where that goes. And we don't have all the props yet. Yeah, and we don't have all the puppets yet because it's a blank slate. At this point, it's the first time that we decide how it's going. You have a skeleton of a puppet, and it looks really and creepy. And you have to try and make it look adorable. <laughs> yeah, we have to do a lot of pretend. <laughs> we get it. We get it. <laughs> yeah, or we have the coke bottles with post-its. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We, so we, we, we write on it. This is I the cart, or this is. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, we have the banana yeah. for scale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is how the puppets look like when the, when they're not finished. Yeah. See, you, you, you want to make this like work, and it is uh, like it should be cute. Cute. Yeah. Okay. It's better. better. Yeah. So, um, this is what we play with for the first rehearsal. Sometimes we have a bit more. Sometimes we have even take one of the uh, premier puppets and uh, and use them, uh, reuse them as cast or as stand-ins for the puppets we will use later. So sometimes we have a wolf playing a bunny. 
Well, anyway, first time on the stage. And sometimes we have a Coke bottle playing the money. Right, you have a Coke bottle running around. <laughs> yeah, and the microphones always fail, don't bother. Yeah, we are working in a small room, so uh, we kind of make it work. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to hand the, the mobile thing to Luna now, because he's going to tell us something about the puppets. Hello. Yeah, you have to tell me, if I'm the one who changed the slides, you actually have to tell me when. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Chita gave you this little script here with the lots of information. Yeah, it's PowerPoint. And around. he said, okay, we have some slides and you will do it. <laughs> Great. Ah, uh, yeah, well, um, yeah, okay, I'm going to try this. <laughs> well, as you can see, we have brought a few puppets. This is about, I think, 50%. Yes, that, this is a small part of the ensemble we have. Yeah. But uh, these are the newer ones we have at the moment. We started off with uh, very small ones, but as the stage grew, we had to go for bigger puppets. Yeah, the slide shows you a couple of our pop builders. Um, on the, I will turn this a little bit so you can see what you're actually talking about. Oh yeah, that is good. Yeah, thank you. Because uh, on the on the top row we have like Henrike, yeah. Lance Ikigawa. We have uh, Tio. On the bottom row we have like Tani. On the on the right we have Runo and Furbin. And there's so much many more. I think every one of us has yeah. done some extent of puppet building sometime. Yeah, mine was crap. Can you go next? Uh, yes, of course. Um, Okay, this is uh, Null. This is our little bunny. I think it's Ice Fuchs' famous puppet. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, As you can see... He's not technically gimmicks, but he's just cute. <laughs> yeah, he is cute, he is cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is the actual puppet. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's one of, actually, one of the really early rock puppets that we're using. And um, yeah. what we're showing on the slide right now yeah. is how it goes from uh, character design to the actual puppet, because we, if we can afford the time, and if, if the people can afford the time, we usually talk with the artist and we tell them about the backstory of the character and we give them some ideas how it's going to look like. And uh, this is what you can see here. That's uh, character sketches done by Henrike that she did of that character. And then uh, later, actually when we liked it, she, she started building that puppet. And um, yeah, as you can see, she is very good with uh, tuny characters and also she has a good idea how you actually have to build a puppet. For, uh, you can see this in the middle, on the upper part. You can see she has painted uh, a hand inside, so how the hand will fit inside the puppet. This is always very good because uh, mostly you have puppets, uh, they look good, but uh, somehow the, the puppet player has to get inside and uh, if I have my hand, have to hold my hand like this, it's not fun going for a puppet for two hours or so. It simply doesn't work. <laughs> She's very good with that, also with the cartoony expressions in the upper left. You put some coffee in here and they get these nice eyes he has right now. So, could he go and he's, he's a feather, really. Yeah, uh, he's extremely light. He has extremely light. Feather, really. He looks overweight a bit. <laughs> That's <laughs> from, from, from all the fast food. <laughs> Yeah, we have we have, pizza. We have prepared pizza, yeah. uh, some some more uh, character designs so we can see how it actually works from the from the design and how the finished puppet looks. Like uh, this is Visonia that we first used in uh, the EF18 show, the Roman show, and we've been recycling her and using her again. I think it's her, right? No. Yeah. Oh, is, is it the one sister? with it's one with the blue eyes? Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm always mixing them up. Yeah. We have two of them. So. <laughs> Uh, this, this is a really early one uh, yeah. where Xan did the design in a 3D program and he, uh, she, uh, he, he uh, sorry, he loves dragons so he did this dragon design of Kai Lung, that's uh, the character's name and he did a very detailed sketch of the, of yeah. the color scheme and in the bottom frame you can see how it turned out in real life and it was like two and a half meters long. Yeah, like, we needed like eight uh, feet, three, nine people, feet long. three people to play it and yeah, it there was, was one guy wearing extremely head. heavy. Yeah. So. That's always the problem with puppets. Uh, I mean, Null is a very light one, and when you compare it to Makani, which is a, a puppet Makani's with... head is, is three times his weight. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Only, it's it's only it contains, uh, I think, six, eight motors yeah. for, for controlling the animatronics. So. Ten. Yeah. Ten. Okay. Ten. You, 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 can so already, you can already hear that everyone has a different strategy of building these things. That's yeah. why we're doing the sketches, so we have some idea of what we're going to end up yeah. with. Because when Henrique built something like this, you basically carved it out of a piece of foam, like, like a, 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, it's nothing. A uh, piece of foam we have here, uh, the head of the snap jaw. He's sitting over there. He's very big. Yeah. If you if you seen last year's show, it wasn't the first scene. It was the big dragon. Can you bring it over here so we can show everybody? The problem is he's he's not very heavy, but it's the size is, is very yeah, big. So you have to be careful with that. It, it takes a couple of people to yeah. play <laughs> to play. Yeah. Actually, two or three people. Uh, this it's is from Lance. Lance yeah. Kikawa. Lance Kikawa. Yeah. Because yeah. that's the problem yeah. with the head. Yeah. It turns around. You have to be very careful with yeah. that. And he put a lot of detail in that you don't actually see in the show, because yeah. uh, it has some uh, supposed to, uh, to have some lamps in it in the in the in the nose and in the paws, and we we knew that we could not possibly play a full dragon on stage because yeah. it would have taken like ten people to play it at this scale, so we uh, we decided it was a dark scene and we had uh, one guy. Leonard playing the paws, I think. Uh, one paw. Yes. In the beginning, so, I played two paws, and then we split it over because it was the distance was too big. So we ended up with I think four or five uh, people. I was just bringing the paws now. They were like like gloves. You have fit in, but you have these long fingers. So you, when you when you wear them, it's like yes, master. <laughs> <laughs> And you like is, Igor. The thing is, we and you can scratch your bone yeah. back with that. We we used a little theater trick. We turned down the light so nobody could see that this thing actually yeah. doesn't have a body. So you can only yeah. see the eyes and everything that glows and everything else, like the puppeteers, is hidden in the dark. Yeah, so exactly we, like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the problem is also with these hands. She just said, "Okay, you have to grab the uh, one of the characters." It's like. I try to, I try to. Yeah, it's really hard to, to you have, don't have a very, very well control about the fingers because they are so big. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Next up uh, on, on the slides, you can just keep showing oh, yeah. this thing. Uh, I like that one, that's Lord, uh, Lord Enoch, Elder Crown. And yeah. I think Tio here also already has a, a printed 3D head, right? Yeah. Yep, that's the first time. Okay. Uh, sometimes uh, our characters are obviously inspired by external sources, like in the top left you can see a character sketch that's originally from the computer game Inherit the Earth. Yep. And we want to have a character who is like the king of, of, of the village and he's like all the authority. Yeah. We cutified a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. But that also, his antlers are formed like a crown here. So this, this also plays into a character a little bit. You try to, to put features into the character design itself. So he looks cute with that he's he's an, he's the ruler of the city. Yeah. <laughs> That's why he has this endless this round one. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. This little guy is called Bottle Brush. Yeah that's Bottle Brush. That's my <laughs> hell here. You can see this is one of the times where the character actually that's looks brush. quite different. Ah, looks quite here, different yeah. from the Hello. sketch. <laughs> hey there. But we all yeah. loved him. The, we all loved him the way he is because yeah. he is like totally adorable, and he's like a somehow dramatic and he's funny huge. sidekick in the yeah. story. He's huge. He's huge and heavy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he has a, a Tio, what is it? A, a cleaning brush, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's called bottle it's brush. It's yeah, he has a brush in, in, brush in his, in his, his tail. tail. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's why. But it works very nicely. Yeah. <laughs> Bounces back. Yeah, maybe Tio wants to uh, talk a few things yeah. uh, about the actual process of how we build it. And uh, the, the first thing that, that Tio does when Tio does the puppet yeah. building, he kind of developed a standard process for coming up with new puppets. And uh, yeah, 3D printing revolutionized everything, and so so does he. Yeah, um, when I first started making puppets. I built them all by hand uh, using the usual materials, but I also used first year building. So plastic mesh, a lot of cable ties, uh, foam for the body, and everything covered with fur uh, using hot glue just to stick it on. So this process uh, took me a lot of time. And um, I soon realized that I couldn't really do it with many puppets. And I wanted to um, find a way where other people could work with me and uh, give them a very simple way to help without having uh, to have all the skills and all the materials and so on. So I started to use 3D printing to make very simple hats that uh, can be used um, to make a puppet. 
and uh, I basically mailed these hats to other people and let them finish it. So, um, for example, uh, Apple Crown overwear was built by Luno, or um, the uh, oh, it's not here, by the way. Um, uh, not here. Um, no, <laughs> we didn't bring all the puppets. Uh, um, yeah, uh, I also uh, did some workshops at home where I invited other people to help me to see how it's built, and uh, it worked very well. We have a lot of puppets now. Yeah, I hope we don't need as many for the next show. I hope so too. <laughs> It'll be all birds. Don't worry. <laughs> <Very> easy. <laughs> yeah, he did one bird, and we we're like, hey, this looks really cool. We should do this. I made two by now. Yeah. Um, you can see on the slides basically the same as, he, uh, as here. Uh, you can see that uh, there's uh, heads being 3D printed and parts being 3D printed. The holes are to reduce weight and to reduce the material we use. And then this is one of the typical, uh, I dare I say, standard bodies. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the lightest way to build bodies and it's basically, uh, it's, it's all home improvement uh, supplies. Um, it, it's basically the black straps are basically s safety straps. The gray parts are basically insulation. Uh, they are meant for like, like heating insulation. The blue thing uh, is like a, uh, how is it called? Like a, sleep, a sleeping mat or a yoga mat, gym yeah. mat and stuff like that. And then it's a lot of hot glue and burnt yes. fingers. Um, I, I made a lot of patterns for these. Um, the pattern for the body is, for example, on Fur Affinity. You can download it, print it, uh, use it. Um, all the other parts also have patterns that um, um, I described in my tutorials. So it, it's not really not uh, complicated to make one of these. Yeah. I think the most complicated part is actually putting the fur on. Yeah. Here, you can now see on the, on the slides, you can see the puppet that is actually made up of the parts you can see here. So it's the body and, and the head that gets joined. And you can actually delegate it, you can send the, the head to someone else and you send the body. As long as you use the same type of fur, you know it's going to fit. Yes. All right. Um, I have to look into my own script, what's next? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I have two little videos next. Um, we'll see if that works. We, we might have some dropouts. Uh, here we can uh, see uh, Tani um, doing uh, the, the fur of one of the non anthropomorphic puppets. It's what, one trial we ever did where we tried to use uh, non anthropomorphic puppets. Hey. puppets. What uh, was it, EF16? Where we have these 17, uh, 17, 17. it was 17, yeah. yeah, the year of the red, where the protagonist was this huge non anthropomorphic dragon that I showed earlier, and those non anthropomorphic tires. And uh, yes, it was a challenge to build, it was a challenge to play, and we're not going to play. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. really complicated. There, there's a reason why we don't use them. Anymore. Yeah, but you, you could see that uh, Tani is trimming the fur at the moment, and that's one exactly like first suit building. It's one of the important things we can do. Uh, the hats of these cats are actually first suit hats that I made. So, but uh, this one in the picture, it, it would have fit me. Next up, uh, we do also some uh, custom coloring, like this is uh, Savannah, the circle. And uh, she looked a little, you know, <laughs> a little simple without the spots on. So uh, this is a little video of Tani uh, putting on the spots with uh, with an airbrush. And as you can see, she looks a lot better with the spots on because you can actually guess the species now. And I think it's one of the nicest puppets that we had. I must say, I really like it. She's all the markings, even yeah. on the back. On the tails, everything yeah. is there. And it needed lots of modification until it works. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the hat is not the original hat. We made two of us. The first one did not really look right. Yes. We had, to, we had to check out the proportions, because if you build yeah. puppets like this, you actually have to have some sense of proportion in it so that they work in the context of the story. You can have like uh, one puppet that is like all cartoony, and you can't have another puppet that is all realistic. You have to find that middle ground. And uh, we used the mongrels middle ground. Yes. Yes. So we watched the TV series, the mongrels, and we saw this is exactly what we want to do. It's only that we're building them about 50% larger. 
uh, we actually had uh, the guys from Mongrels play up one of these uh, these puppets, and they were like, "Oh, they, these are like wait for the size, honestly." But oh, are you holding this up for so long? And we talked to Jim Martin, that's one of the directors behind the Sesame Street, and uh, you also saw our puppet show. And uh, we asked him, "Is there any special trick you do you know, not to sprain your um, your shoulder?" And he said, "Well, yeah, your scenes are too long." That's it, it's that easy. We said, oh yeah, you can talk, you're working on television, you yeah. can make it as short as you want to. <laughs> it's like, can't. okay, it's a little bit different with us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, um, yes, and the thing we also have to uh, keep in mind is that our our puppeteers don't have the right size. Uh, it's like Icebox and Pan, maybe you can just, just yeah. stand next to each other. Yeah. And um, so there's, there's already a difference and uh, now, if no, 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 Pan is already wearing her shoes. Yeah, yeah, she's wearing high, not even high heel shoes. These are uh, elevated shoes. Yes. They're really yeah. these, this height of a sole under them, so she can actually play. So this is the problem we have to deal with. We have only one size of puppet, and we only have one size of stage. And but, play rail. <laughs> and, yeah, and uh, the thing is, we have to somehow find a middle ground to place the rail that we play on, that everyone can actually play it. And this is the reason why you sometimes see our heads, because we have to have the, the smallest uh, puppeteer uh, as, as a measure. And uh, she's already working hard to do, to do it bigger, and we, we keep like, like putting up coke bottles, either coke crates and stuff like that, for her to stand on when, when, when she just keeps getting lower and lower. Well, sometimes it, it looks like this, she's standing there holding the puppet up, right up, and I'm standing next to her, playing like this with her, so it yeah. works right, but it's not good for my back, but <laughs> And we have people like Ovolf over there, who's yeah. even taller. Yeah. Even taller. Uh, tiger's eye. Tiger's, tiger's eye. eye. Yeah. Who, who uh, has uh, one of the jobs, like uh, carrying stuff around. I think you get the point. <laughs> I, I suggest, I says, I suggest uh, not only the type of puppeteer differs. I suggest you, you, you grab just Frostwind and Rubber Song and Rain Dancer, which are supposed to be like a couple and the yeah. kid. Uh, you, you grab those and show people how different uh, the yeah. size of the puppets is. Because we're, we're still talking about the portions of the, of the puppets. Sometimes you want a puppet that is actually like, like a kid. And uh, it needs to still be like a playable rod puppet, and that get, really gets a problem because you can't make it much smaller because your hand won't fit inside. Yeah, not, not only yeah. that, it's fun yeah, well, when you build it when you can't fit inside yourself. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> we, we also have that because the puppets are finished not only when the director is happy, also when the puppeteers are happy because they might be too heavy, uh, yeah. they might be too small. We had one time we had like a puppeteer who must put his arm tight. inside. It's like yeah. we had the most beautiful puppet, every puppeteer was going like, does everybody have like noob on them? Yeah. I, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> rain I wasn't rare, but I built it. And suddenly I got this tweet Tio, your fox is too tight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was my like yeah. uh, usually, usually, when you fit your hand inside the yeah. puppet, you try to play it like this. So the, yeah. the, the, the lower jaw goes with the thumb and the rest of the head with the rest of the fingers. Yeah. But sometimes we have puppets you have to play that, that my middle finger, for example, has to go into the lower jaw and have to talk like this, which is really an interesting to do. But these puppets here are much better built for that. Well, Rain Dancer is a bit of an exception because he is really, really small. It's a small yeah. guy in the middle right now, you can't see. And you can see now clearly how it looks behind the stage when all the people gathering together, hugging each other. It's a bunch of people standing on each other's toes. Yeah. And his, his head inside is so small, I can't even get my whole hand inside. I have to do it like this. Yeah. Like two fingers yeah. and a thumb. And curl out the other fingers like that so you get, they don't get in the way. So yeah. I tried this, I tried... And Everything is just very no, Don't worry, the, yeah. the hurting will no, go away. No. So basically, you have yeah. father and mother and the, and the kid now, yeah. and you can see how we try to kind of mix the characteristics of like a bobcat and uh, uh, and uh, and a vixen, and uh, we made it like we lampshaded it by by asking his dad uh, uh, or asking his uncle, like Uncle Brushy, mum is like a, a a fox and puppy is like a cat. How, how, how does that even work? work? <laughs> And uh, yeah, we kind of designed the story around it, and we came up with a funny explanation to make to make it work. So, next question is, how do you play these things? <laughs> Carefully, <laughs> very carefully. <laughs> so, um, yeah, 
um, when, when we started. Do we have a hand puppet there? Yeah, we have a hand puppet here. Because I'd, love to, I'd, lo I'd love to uh, show the difference uh, between yeah. how we did it like, uh, like, like 10 years ago and how, how we did it today. This is, that is a typical folk mania's hand puppet. Um, it's a very small one compared to these big guys. We had, I think our stage was half the size of that one, probably. Yes. So we started with the small ones, and uh, well, we made this later. These are 15% bigger, based on the pattern of the fox or the lions here. They are also a little bit bigger now. Then we use the, those are the living puppets. They are a bit bigger, but they are extremely cartoony. So they don't only fit, only fit all, uh, they don't always fit the, the scenes we're trying to play. Sometimes you just have uh, to use a very simple puppet. This is basically some fur and a beak. Yeah, we use this, this is actually cell built. Yeah, that was the have 12 or something like that. Uh -huh. well, you need some from birds, but you can only see uh -huh. the heads. And these are called hand puppets because you basically yeah. play them only with one hand, which makes it really easy because you only need one puppeteer or one yeah. character. And you can have them like read the script with one hand, play with the other hand, and you'll have it like a, a microphone like I'm wearing right now, and they can actually do the puppet and the dialogue at the same time. You can even use very small puppets. We did this. Yeah, when you have many of them. Many of them. <laughs> yeah, we had really many of them. We had a full construction site with meerkats, and this, yeah. is, this is like the, the G. One of the last like the yellow have. head. <laughs> Yeah, so everybody knows that some some paper, so it works. Yes. And I, I'm playing it like this. <laughs> and uh, we basically switched to raw puppets because we did something bigger. Because yeah. we moved to a different venue, and we could just put a two meter stage on like a ten meter stage of the venue. Yeah. So we need to come up with ways to make the show bigger. And the obvious way to go is to put raw puppets. Uh, ice books. <laughs> Maybe you can explain uh, why they're called rod puppets and how do you actually play them? Yeah, uh, rod puppets. It's let me get one of the simplest. Yes, that one. The simplest rod puppet line? we have. So this is basically these the are your hands. Come on. <laughs> yeah, it's basically the easiest and simplest way to build a rod puppet. It's just a lot of fur and there's stuffing in it. It's just like uh, it's foam, and I think it's a bit of wool, but it's just. That is not more in there. There's a bit of cardboard here for the mouth, so it stays nice and flat. Yeah, some polyfill in here, and he he has actually a joint in here where the polyfill is squeezed, so the arm bends realistically. So how do you play these? So when you have a normal puppet, you go like this and talk like this and, and uh, move your head left and right and everything, so we can kind of do some expressions here and there. But if you want to do something more complex, you need arms, because arms. Well, you can talk and do things like that with your arms and express, you express yourself uh, in a way you can't do without it, of course. And if you ever played something on a theater stage, on a real theater stage, um, your, your face is basically meaningless. Because people are sitting like 30 meters, 40 meters away and don't see you really. But they see what you're doing with your arms and your body. And that's what we are doing with these, because we don't really have a uh, way to um, change the facial Most features. of the time we don't. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes, Sometimes we, we have, have it as a special thing. Does it have a, 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 a foam face? Soft it's all foam. Yeah. It's all okay. foam. Yeah. The others, they have mesh like him. He can't. Yeah. He can it's move the, the muscle well, a little bit. I can, I can make him yeah. sniff a little bit, but yeah. it's, it's really hard. We have some puppets who can wiggle ears and close and open the eyes and something like that, but most of them are, are very basic. So, and we need these cables to uh, operate, which yes. is really hard. I can demonstrate that to you? Can, can, can demonstrate it over there? So, yeah, how do you see, play these? You can yeah. see we have the rods here, yeah. which control the hands. This is obviously the, the reason why they are named rod puppets, because you have the rods on the hands, where you can basically move the whole arm and the hands at the same time. So, you, you can twist the rod to have, yeah. uh, like, the open, open the hand, turn it to the outside, turn it to the inside, and of course position it the way you want it to. Yeah. Here you can see he has here this clips for the rods, so he just can go a little bit in this direction, while he has additional possibility to move. But this also makes it complicated. <coughs> the hand will probably go <coughs> like this. Yeah, it needs a bit of practice, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and you can see when, when I'm, I'm going to talk, 
and I'm going to use my arms to uh, show what I want to show. I'll show it over there, I'll show over there, something like that, or just well, rub the belly. Rub my belly. Rub the something like that. Uh, the problem is, when you have a show that is two or three hours long, and you only have four rehearsals to do that, you cannot memorize all your lines. So how do you do it? You have a second person who plays the arms. Yeah, go in front. Do, do it the real way. Yeah. <laughs> so like this. Here. <laughs> Just hold it. He has the text so he's on, basically on the always at my side. He's yeah. actually he's the one who's playing uh, the arms at, um, at the last show for um, for River Song, and he actually always plays the arms of my puppets basically. <laughs> and we are we are we are rehearsing our steps. So when I say okay, now we go left and run around around here, and then stop, turn around and run back, and stop again. We have to do it in sync, because when I run away, my arms don't follow, it looks silly, right? <laughs> so it always has to work in some way. Or if, uh, if he's going to interact with something, reading, uh, reading on a cell phone, yeah, we have a stage and holding a cell phone, and here, still reading my script, and playing up there and reading on this thing and hoping that my arm's doing the right thing <laughs> and, uh, and looking up and, okay, hmm, how do we even do this? Let me see. And he starts playing around and doing things and I'm speaking well, the lines I have here. I really have to trust my, my uh, arms and my <laughs> stage hands here to do the right thing. That's how, basically yeah. how you do it. You need two, maybe three people to play one of these puppets. Now comes the next level. Um, you switch to Turkish. Yes, and try, try to do some interaction with two puppets. Oh, God! Yes. <laughs> yes. So there we have... Do the high five. five. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then get to this, this is actually this is the is hardest part. Try to yeah, do a high five with two puppets. It's an internal joke, but it's one of the hardest things you can do with two puppets. Yeah, yes, two doing a high five for the hands. Yes, yes, yes. yes. See two two we, have, yes. we have this running joke that goes like, Hey, Leonard, high five! <laughs> <laughs> You will, we will see what I mean later. As Asfil said, sometimes it's, it's, it's a problem. You, you look at your script and you have to... You're, you're looking in this direction, look at your script and the puppet and usually, talks in this direction. So right, and usually you have to always like be this. aware where the hand is. Yeah. Or like this, because there's no yeah. room. <laughs> okay, try, try to improvise a little bit if it's possible. Okay, uh, who's that? Is that Vizonia? I think it's Vizonia, right? Hey, Vizonia, how are you doing? Oh, I'm sorry. Can I give you a hug? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, pretty, pretty, please. With cherry on top. <laughs> okay. Welcome oh, here. This is really hard. It looks so easy when they do it. Try, we, we, if, if we have the time after this talk is done, we might have some time left, and we'll give you this uh, opportunity to come up here and look at the puppets, look at the, look at the technology, and you can, if you, if you would try to play one of these puppets, you can just come up to us after this talk and, and ask for it, and uh, you can try to make two puppets hug. It's really hard. Okay, what's even, hard, what's even harder is to make, to make them interact okay. with a prop. Sometimes to have like a, like a piece of equipment that they hand over, and handing stuff over is like one of the hardest part. Try try to make them hand over this yeah, the banana. The banana. Some, let's let's do, we'll use something in to change. change. You know where the switch is. Yeah. We have these things. It's like a torch that we. Okay. Have. Which is going to be my stage. Da, 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 we come da, da. from over there. You stay there. This is totally improvised. <laughs> yep. Yeah, but it could be from see. a real scene. So, so okay. Count the people running. involved in this. <laughs> <laughs> Your turn! Your turn! <laughs> <laughs> you see the problem? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, you start using a lot of space behind our stage because we have five people involved in, in playing two characters like this and you actually have to make sure that you have the space to turn and that people don't step on their toes. Yeah. And it really takes a lot of uh, rehearsal to do that. Let, try, 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 one, tr try one of the knives then. Yeah. Step now. You step now. What? Yes. <laughs> or you use... Oh, that's, that's sexist. Yeah, or the girl must kill the guy, otherwise... <laughs> no, she can no, disarm me. Talk, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, yeah, well. Okay, you're the zombie. Oh, what well, a zombie? What? What? Wait. Ah! Ah! 
I always wanted to do that. <laughs> so you can see sometimes you can do <laughs> Okay, now what to write now? So our, our script here says we will show you a handover prop and do high five. So this is completely improvised. Right? Yes. <laughs> it is so much more fun to do this. And you can see sometimes he puts rods on the props. So uh, the people handling them have something to grip on because you don't want to see like a hand every time uh, a piece of uh, a piece of prop gets handed around. Our oh, sword, sword fight from last year. Yeah, sword yeah. fight was yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really hard. <laughs> okay, are we going to try the high five? <laughs> <laughs> I know with the sword. No. <laughs> you might lose your hand. Yeah, we we also, we already uh, put the torch but away. Isn't it called a lucky paw? Uh, yes, but it's not the happy ending. Like I like to keep it attached, right? Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, you go. Hey, high five! <laughs> <laughs> so Almost. that's why that's why we replaced it yeah. afterwards. We wanted to have a high five in one of our shows, and then it didn't work, so we replaced it. Hey! Boom! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Try to kiss. That's another really oh. hard one. Oh yeah. I can kiss her? Really? Yes. A real it's a, girl? It's, it's a stage kiss. <laughs> a real girl? Uh, oh, this is really intense. Yeah. <laughs> you have to actually know which way the other guy is turning. Go get <laughs> oh. Otherwise, they will just bump their noses into each other and it will look like yeah. everything but not a kiss. Ah. Yeah, so that, that, that's how we play these things. <laughs> Give a round of applause for the please. As you also can see, we, we made some clothings here. We usually take them from uh, kids' stores because they have the right size. I think 124 or something. Hmm? 128? Okay. Yes, yes. We, found, we, found out the actual, we found out the actual sizes of the puppets. So yeah. if, if it's like a modern store, we'll just buy clothes like uh, at, a, at a discount store. And uh, we sometimes wonder who actually wears this except puppets. There's some really, really atrocious stuff there. Small people. Yep. This is the next topic I'm going to talk about, and this is uh, rehearsal and sound design. <laughs> you might wonder how that does that go together, but it actually is actually quite. <laughs> He's seeing this slide for the first time. <laughs> it's, it's, yes, yes. Uh, we thought this picture uh, best combines rehearsal and sound design. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, the first rehearsal is this basically the day after the first reading, and uh, the first rehearsal is a bit like getting the band back together. Yeah, it is. It's basically the first time in a year that, that everyone who's going to take part meets. And um, yeah, we, yeah, we're coming from all over Germany and sometimes even abroad. So. Yeah, so it's pretty much like a family reunion. So yeah. uh, we meet at the at the rehearsal facilities. Um, uh, we, we, we set up the rehearsal stage and all the, the front of house, which is very similar to what we've set up right now. We have breakfast, so somebody is bringing like bread rolls, someone else is bringing like, like sausages and stuff. And uh, yeah, we, we try out the stuff we read and do little excerpts from the scripts. Everybody picks yeah. their favorite part of the script and checks yeah. out if it really works on the stage. Yeah. You, you can see the workshop we're using here. There's actually tools on the wall and stuff like that. It's someone's car workshop we're using. And uh, yeah, when we have difficult parts, we, we like start doing the, re the rehearsal. You can see that we already have uh, like a skeleton puppet here. And yeah, these are two stand-ins. The one is one is Makani's uh, skeleton, which will be used later actually. And the, on the left is Savannah in raw form. Which <laughs> she can't, she can't really tell it is Savannah, but it is. Yeah. <laughs> Then I usually uh, have my uh, birthday at some rehearsal. I think I had my birthday at rehearsals like three years in three a row years or something. Years, yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm crazy like that. So if eventually at midnight this happens. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we have long hours in the evening where we have both to work, but we also let's sit together and talk and, and eat. And um, sometimes it gets really, 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 really late and looks like this. <laughs> and um, yeah, we usually have a barbecue for everyone. So it's it's pretty much like a family reunion, but it's also um, a, lot, a lot of really hard family members. Yeah, eventually we actually get rehearsing. Uh, as you have, can see, you have seen how we play this puppet. You can count how many people are behind the stage right now. 
So um, for the speaking roles, it's at least three people per puppet. <coughs> and um, uh, for all the non-speaking puppets, it's at least one, sometimes two, depending on what they're supposed to do. Uh, can you go back? Oh, of course I can. Oh. By the way, that's also a reason why we didn't go with uh, the feral puppets. Because for a feral puppet, you need three puppeteers. Because you need one for the front paws, one for the hind paws, one for the head. So then it's even more crowded. That, that was yeah. really crazy. And, and you need a fourth uh, person to handle the props, so it, yeah, it gets really complicated. <laughs> You have suddenly have to play for legs. And what, uh, what you can see here in this picture is that it's a press rehearsal, so there are a lot of stand-ins. And so this is from the Keepers of the Light show. And in the back, you have a Dalmatian firefighter. You have Null. You have someone. Uh, who was the Martin? That was from the, the yeah, light yeah, show. Really show. Yeah, yeah. We basically grab all yeah, the puppets yeah. we have. Yeah, and I, I think it's, it's it's a scene with Brushy. So Brushy wasn't built. So Leonard is playing a rat instead of her skunk. Uh, so this is the normal mix of characters that you kind of have to put post-its on to remember who is who. Exactly. Um, I think this made sense at the time. I'm not really sure. <laughs> it, killed <laughs> it actually killed my cell phone. Yes. You can see that I didn't care. This, this is the stage we're rehearsing on. Uh, it's basically a piece of truss like the one that the lamps are built on. It's just sideways and we built a little wooden plank on top of it and uh, we are losing a lot of straps to actually put black balls, not red one, but it's uh, pretty much like that one here. Um, and we have some speakers there. And this is how it looks from the other side, it's really, really crowded. This is a little less space than we have on the actual stage. And this is how we play, you can see the truss here uh, on the, and how we like fix the wooden plank on it. And there, you can see the white stickers on there, the There's white stickers uh, on the wooden plank, you probably, hopefully you can see that. Uh, we numbered the section of the stage because we always get confused about what is left and what is right, because we have two perspectives of each. Even if we, if we write that scene, I usually have like a mirror image of this in my head and he has. Because he sits at the front of the house, I'm usually in the back. And he says, okay, they're coming from the left. Okay, they're coming in from the left. It's like, why are you coming in from the right? I'm coming in from the left. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we now say he comes, uh, he comes in from number one. Yeah. Because we all agreed on which side of the stage that is. Uh, yeah, front of house, that's the control booth. That's how it looks when we rehearse. Like we have uh, like the sound desk um, all uh, in the middle. You have like the sound effects. Uh, that is me sitting all the way on the left. And you have Tsanavo, who is... Uh, uh, usually doing the lights, uh, he's sitting here, um, and he's basically the lights on, lights off guy. Because <laughs> we don't have much lighting during during the her rehearsal, but uh, it's important to have the cues when there's supposed light and when there's not supposed light. <laughs> Turn off the lights, please. <laughs> That's how it works. Look at the script, no lights. <coughs> I'm script. Two, three, Lash. Yeah, this is all of the rehearsals we do with stand-ins. This was Eve 19. All right? Can you hear me? Hello, I'm a wife. This, this is how we rehearsed. Loud and clear. Excellent. We're in shallow water, so that's not much we need to take care of. And yes, just notice the little little lower right are exactly what you think they are. Just make sure you don't bump into anything with your gear. Your life may be tender. Not to mention it will get heavy icon. Not to mention it will cost me a fortune. Wow! This is beautiful! Yeah. What you see is actually what is taking place on stage. It sure is. In the dark. But as a marine biologist, you probably know a whole lot more about all this than I do. Well, reading about it in a textbook is one thing. But this is the first time I can actually see it myself. It's mind-blowing! Look over there! And it's me and oh, I from oh, the dark. Oh, they are concentrating the giant on the giant squid! Oh, I knew that one. It's the umbrella squid. Club. I like the umbrella squid. This is actually how we got the idea to make an umbrella squid in the water. But I the only thing we did have was so close. Thanks a lot for taking the time to meet him, Makani. You're very welcome. And now you're seeing the finished scene. <laughs> There is a shark swimming in your Three! Woohoo! <laughs> there we go! Is everything alright? Can you hear me? Wow. Oh, this is so beautiful! Woohoo! <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah! 
Yet yeah, the same amount of people on the stage it's doing sure it. You just can't see them because it's all dark. But as marine biologists, you probably know a lot more about all this than I do. Well, the thing about this textbook is one thing, but this is the first time I can actually see it myself. It's mind-blowing. Look, over there! Oh, you don't see these very often nowadays. This used to be the common oh, in the house. So you can tell there's a lot of work that goes into the actual choreography of how puppets work. And there's sometimes it's really difficult to put it into the script because there's only dialogue. And you can't really have like instructions that, that show it all how it's supposed to work. Um, you, usually, um, you usually start off with a script that reads like this. And it says like, this is a different scene now. It says like, Savannah opens the lid of her trash can looking out. Savannah starts swaying from left to right trying to make her trash can topple over. There's a sound effect, left, right, left, right, fall. The third trash can sways and fall over. Domino effect, the third trash can topples over the second one. The second trash can topples over the first one. The first trash can knocks over the beam that holds the tin roof. Squeak, watch out, economy! <laughs> then, one side of the tin roof falls down, forming a ramp. Dweak. Crash and slide. The stuff stack on the roof slides down, hitting the other side of the seesaw. And people, Stop sprung, you know, <laughs> exactly. And then puppeteers usually go, what the hell? <laughs> and we go like, okay, yes, um, we agree this is not really easy to understand, so we show you. We usually use gummy bears. We said, okay, you're the red gummy bear, you're the yellow gummy bear, and you're the green gummy bear. And then we try to show how everyone is supposed to play this on a piece of paper. And they go like, what the fuck? <laughs> and they said, okay, let's make a script and explain you how things are going. And they are, yeah, I, I, I somehow where this is going, but I, what, what, what is that thing on the right, and what's that thing on the left? And yeah, what's like, the sequence of events? Yeah, how it's going to happen, and that's, that's the moment when Icefox goes like, okay, uh, I will make you some animatics, so you can understand how it actually works. And he does that little animation that actually shows you how it's going to work. And then people go like, It's oh. that simple. <laughs> it actually is, but it, it involves like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight moving parts. And you have to kind of keep it uh, in sequence. This is why people keep telling me, do something easy, do comedy. And we go like, comedy is physical humor. How are we going to do it? We're going to like need like 200 props to do that. And um, after that, we send this animatics to everyone, and then we try to rehearse it. And this is how usually it looks. Oh, oh, whoa! Oh! Whoa! Yay! Perfect! Yay! I think that was the first time we got it right. It took a little bit longer than that. And as you can see, we're always using stand-ins, like stuff that we have uh, lying around in the workshop post. It's, it's one bananas and coke cans and everything that works because we have that uh, in the workshop um, and this is how the finished scene uh, looks in the show <laughs> It was really hard to get right. <laughs> it was really hard to build. Yes. And yeah, there's the guy who built this incredible machine. Yeah. <laughs>
So I told you earlier that the first words that we do in the sound design are really closely intertwined. I'm going to, uh, to show you why. Because the dialogue we speak at the first rehearsal is going to use as a guide track for the actual sound effects and the music we do. It's kind of a compromise because the, the performance at the first rehearsal is usually crappy, so there's a lot of editing going on. But um, yeah, uh, if you have seen last year's uh, show, we're going to show you an excerpt of the first rehearsal of the scene with the dragon that attacks the dog. And uh, you can see that now. Is anybody out there? Shit! 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 Oh no! No! Not the fire! No! So one guy does the head, then look at what is going to be the pause. Again, we are practicing the choreography so that everybody knows where they're going. What in the night's name is going on? I'm over here! Help me! No! Hey, hey, you filthy beast, get the hell out of here! Or I'll throw you out the eyes out of my light! So yeah, that's, that's the excerpt of the rehearsal, and uh, we are actually recording that dialogue that you speak. Um, as you can see in the front, on the front right down here, there's like a PC running that records everything we say and everything we do. And um, I'm going to try and show you um, how actually we, we, we put it together and how we use that guide track to get to the uh, final soundtrack. And uh, we're going to try, if this thing drops out, I'm going to put it like on the pre rec channel or something like that. Let's see if that works. So, that was wrong. Okay, the software I'm using here is called Samplitude. It's a hard disk recording software that uh, can be used for music productions or everything else. I will show this message again. And uh, I'm going to try you the give you the best view that I can because the, the projection screen is a little bit small. And uh, basically every line we see here is one channel of audio that get, gets mixed into each other. And it's a F -F -F. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I need to scroll all the way to the left to show it to you. So um, the thing you can <coughs> see up here, that is basically our recording of the of the track that uh, you saw earlier, it should be. Oh shit! 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 Ah! Out! Damn! Oh no! No! Not the fire! No! Because of the honey! Ah! Oh, out! Help! Ah! Oh, get out! Out! Oh. I'm a little bit afraid of this one. <laughs> Uh, you can say it's in the waveform how it comes together, and um, this basically like has all the glitches in it, and it has like all the rehearsal fluff in it. Like, pleased to meet you, Frostland. Here, take my hand. Yes. Oh, this is already the edited version. Okay, so we have all the dialogue in that scene in there. Um, to we have against giving shelter to someone who's lost. And um, uh, what you can already see here is that. Uh, Okay, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's all the talk and all the stuff in it, all the makeshift sound effects that I did with the microphone. So, um, like, uh, like, like myself going like... One step... <laughs> Quite obviously you don't want that for work. It, it's, it, it really... Uh, yeah, we, we do it like this. So what I do is like I cut out all the stuff that I want so that I have the raw dialogue so it becomes more like something you'd want to hear. Help! Help! And then we just we just turn it uh, turn it down and cut out the parts that uh, that we don't want to hear. And um, it's one of those things if you look if you listen to this. Festival night should be the best night of the year, not your worst. 
You'll be safe at my house, I promise. You have the raw dialogue, but it doesn't take place anywhere. You can't hear any presence. So the thing I'm doing now is I do add what we call ambience. And uh, that is something that is in the tracks down here. So I'm zooming a little bit out. I'm trying to actually find the right place. So what I did in this take is, as you can see, there's gaps up here. So I cut out all the sound effects uh, that we made with the microphone that we don't want to hear. And there is something I added. You can see down here, I've added five tracks of uh, sound effects. And uh, these are basically called ambient sound effects because they run all the time and they define the, the room that something is happening in. So I'm just going to play the first line here. Turned up a little bit, it should be the the, the scene. Yep. It's it's very uh, very low. So, so I just have to turn it on a little bit. So we have some wind going on. So we know it's taking place outside. Then um, add some, some more wind to make sure it's dark. Then uh, we add some uh, some cicadas and some, some grasshoppers to make it sound like it's in the night. Then we add some more atmosphere and in the end to make it really spooky we're adding owls and we are adding uh, the wolves. So we now it's spooky, it's outside, it's night. So this ambient track actually carries a lot of information that is part of the scene that you can't see. Because it's going to be pitch black, nobody knows what's happening. There's no backdrop, there's no lights, but the ambient is actually telling, telling you uh, when and where it's taking place. So, uh, if you play it all together... No, come back where you came it. from! No. Get out! Uh, it's and you too! Like uh, uh, leave her alone! Suddenly know, know where it's taking Tomorrow place, at which time of the day, lights. and at which what time. What are you going to tell the keepers if they see me? The festival of lights is a celebration of love. And it suddenly gets atmospheric, so you suddenly start getting goosebumps when you hear that. The next thing that is a really complicated one is adding sound effects. I'm going to show you this one. This is when I further work on this. Um, you can see it's becoming a radio play, basically. So we're taking the dialogue that is already there and we're adding several, several, several layers of sound effects to make this work. Like I'm going to single out just this one. Like uh, you hear the little evil sounds that the pig rats make because it's like pictures in the night that start attacking them. And you make sure they sound like you don't want to meet these guys. I'm not sure what actual sound this is. I think it's screaming of pigs, uh, like, yeah. like pitched down half the half the speed. And uh, you want more of that. So you layer them. And you want to become, them, become more and more because there's more coming. Um, I'm going to show you another layer. And they have little scary feet, you know, and they run through the grass and they're following you. So that's the sound they make. And um, of course, again, it's a lot of them. So we're laying on that. That's actually me in front of a microphone, like like shaking some straws and doing that. Like this, this, this little cocktail decoration that have like the flower top. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. shaking that in front of the microphone to make that to make that sound like little creatures. Yeah, take, uh, different takes of that. And um, at some point, uh, we have the big dragon come in. This is what's happening in the, in the track star here. I think I did that. I'm at the wrong. So the sounds are actually like the roar of a tiger that we pitch down and you have all the, the heavy impact sounds that will tell you that this creature is big, that it's fierce, it's going to kill you and it's going to be, it's really, really heavy. And when you play this together, 
with the ambient sound and the really crappy dialogue that you had. It starts sounding like Shit! Shit! how you build the scene, because the sound tells a, a big part of the story that you can't actually play. So it gives you a, 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 a sense of scale and uh, how fierce the creatures actually are. Because you saw all the makeshift sound effects that we did during the rehearsal, it really made you laugh. But it actually just gave Jerry goosebumps when I played it. So I know it's right. When it gives your sound engineer goosebumps, you know everything works. And um, this is actually the track that I then save and I send it to Scotland, to Fox and Moore. And he then scores this thing like it's a movie, which is really, really amazing for me because I have no idea how he does it. And uh, the music um, basically acts like, a, like an amplifier. It basically takes the emotions that all uh, the, the scenes have and it, it actually adds a layer. This is the music track right here. And uh, I can play you just the music track. This is how it sounds without everything else. And it gives you this ominous feeling that something is going to come. And then eventually the pig rats are trolling up with the holes they're going to attack. It's really dramatic. It's like a jaws, you know, as the sharks are coming. And then suddenly the big snap draw appears. <laughs> I don't know how you're feeling. This really sounds like a movie now. And eventually, when when they <laughs> and then suddenly you have all that dramatic dialogue. And uh, there's also music in the dialogue that underscores what they're talking about. If they're sad, if they're happy, what's happening. But at the same time, this can we call it underscore because it does not really, really be. Uh, it's, it's not spectacular music by itself. But uh, and it, it makes sure that it never gets in the way of the dialogue. But uh, we do have uh, certain cue lines in the dialogue that uh, that are triggering different parts. Of You can see at the end of, of the story of that scene, uh, there's hope, there's, they're going to move on. And yes, Frostwood uh, is telling her, oh, yes, I'm going to help you, and you can come with me. Best night of the year, not your worst. You'll be safe at my house, I promise. My name is Riversong, what's yours? And that's how it works. And now, let's just for fun, let's play a few seconds of just everything together. My clip a little bit. Hello? Is there anybody out there? <laughs> Shit! Shit! Ah! Oh. Damn! Oh no! No! Not the fire!
now that we have that sound effect, that we have all that layers, the problem is when we play this on stage, all the timing is going to be unpredictable because there will be audience reactions. Uh, you don't know how long the, the actors are going to play this. Um, so um, you, if you just exported this and we played this and we tried to like play to it, it would totally not work because if there's just one moment of, um, of audience clapping, of audience laughing, or someone losing a line, they will get out of Zoom. So um, this is the first step we have in doing the soundtrack. What we now do is I'm taking parts of this and I'm ripping it all apart. We're pretty much scoring it like you would a computer game. There are certain cues in the dialogue that will uh, initiate certain change in the soundtrack, and there are certain cue lines where specific sound effects are triggered. Um, for example, you can see there are markers up here. So I took parts from, from the big mess you saw earlier here. So I took part of this big cloud of noises and I basically keep separate them, uh, separating them into, uh, into different parts. And these markers are the same markers you found earlier in the script where it says SND0101. So basically we have the one part of the address. Well, so if not, it goes like, hello, is there someone? And there's another queue line that triggers the pig rats attacking. And at the set, just like that in the script, we also have like lines that will take you when to stop the sound effect. So we're intentionally making them a little bit longer than we need, and we pay them out at specific times. And you have the pig rats running away. Then you have rivers on Python. And this is all elements that you saw earlier in that big line. We just separate them so they make sense, so we can trigger them at the time they actually played. Then we have like a the pub, the snap draw, or a And that's that's basically how we rip everything apart. Everything of this has been like apart. Yes? You said that we can add them as they're being supposed to be played. Yes. I'm a little confused. Are these things that you're actually inserting in the live show or something? Yes. Like these, these are the actual cues I'm playing in the live show. So it's not all one continuous pre-recorded. Exactly. Right? You can't. Oh. You can't. All, when you play, all the, the voices are live, and all the sound effects actually have uh, special cues in the soundtrack. Uh, uh, in, the, in the script that tell me when to play them. So at, uh, as early as I get this stuff finished, the better I can learn when the sound effects are coming. And sometimes we have parts of the choreography that are triggered by the sound effects. So people are waiting for a certain sound to play, and sometimes I'm waiting for certain words to be said. So I know, okay, now is the time to start this. Yeah, the curtain opens and nothing happens. <laughs> it happens. Poppity is waiting, and waiting. I'm waiting for them, waiting. And then, <laughs> oh, the door sound, clap, clap, and then they come in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we do the same with the soundtrack. I will zoom in this for a little because the soundtrack, as we get it from Fox and Word, is basically a movie score. And uh, I'd like to show this. Um, this is one of the first music course, uh, cues we heard. And one of the things, I have no idea how long I'm supposed to play this because the scene may take longer. They may take, take a li little more time to get in or whatever. So what I do, I do it like computer game developers, uh, developers do it. Um, I will take some part of this original score, I will cut it, and I will just basically do it. So I will repeat parts and basically turn this into an endless track that I can fade in the moment it's needed and I can have, uh, fade, fade, out, um, fade out the moment I don't need it. So basically, when, when the puppet is take a really long time, it's going to sound silly, but there's no, never going to be any silence when that happens. And uh, even even the part where there's that conflict. And basically starts going from, from a certain point again. And that's, that's how we put together the soundtrack, we have sound cues um, and we have music cues. And that's uh, how we put it all together. And uh, when we're done with this, 
and you eventually have saved all these things. Um, I will have uh, separate wave paths which compromise uh, any, uh, any, any part of that thing. And uh, full scoring uh, for the music, for example, takes roughly like three or four weeks, depending on how much time Proxy More has, which is, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, he has pretty high uh, professional standards. I think if you have time to write the music for, for, for movies, if you don't, don't count the actual recording of things because he does it all electronically, um, he's, doing it, uh, he's doing it quite fast. I think you have about the same time when you're doing it professionally. And um, yeah. All in all, um, the score for Keepers of the Light has 77 minutes of continuous music without the loops. And um, just for scale, uh, the Aliens original soundtrack by, um, by Jerry Goldsmith it has like nine, 39 minutes. So it's, it's uh, an amazing amount of, of music we're talking about here. And um, yeah. Now I need this one. This is the actual software uh, we use to play uh, at the convention. It's called SoundQ System. It's basically a uh, program that is designed for theater fashions like we do. And um, you can see all the numbers of the sound cues that we have played earlier here on the left side. It's, it's identical to the markers in this script and the project you saw earlier. And now you have descriptions of what it actually does. You have like Dark Force, Spooky, Scary Pig, Reds 1, Scary Pig, Reds 2. And the thing that is very important for me, I have cue lines here. It takes me which line I'm supposed to wait for to trigger the next sound effect because I can't read along the script. On the other hand, there's like, uh, I think, the I've written, I think there's about 300 of these sound cues for, for an entire show that I have to keep track of. And uh, th there's a couple of cues that uh, I can trigger by just playing a button. This is all the, this is all this, uh, the sound cues that are going to be used during sword fights or if something falls down. So I basically trigger them like pressing a key here on the keyboard. So, and I can let people fight, I can just react to the movement on stage. Um, there's also sequential cues that the one I'm using here. So I can say, uh, first scene starts. And it will start the aliens. And then I'm basically waiting for, uh, re uh, I think for Pan to be the right lights. And she will eventually see, there must be a way out of this ticket. Hello? Is the menu out there? Oh shit! Oh no! No! Don't! Not my life! Don't let it end this way! No! No! Get off! Get off! Ah! Ah! Help! Help! No! No! The laptop's attacking me! Don't attack my body! That's the first time! They have to protect the reality! Eventually, it happens in like the second try. But then she's quite Oh, help! Help! Uh, Is anyone out there? Yeah, I'm over here! Help me! Ah! Get out of here, or I will burn your ugly eyes out with my life! And then you can hear the, all the music cues are switching, all the actual sound effect cues are working together. And eventually the scene will end. So you have got a very, very short uh, version of that scene. And that's how we put it back together again. So I have my cue lines and I program everything in the software and uh, I'm going to trigger it when it's needed. Simple, isn't it? <laughs> all right. Um, Yes, yes. We are, we are losing time. I'm going to show you a very short excerpt of the finished scene, but I'm going to like like break it because we're running out of time. This is how the finished scene looks like. Light so pure, light so true. I give myself to you. Keep on moving, girl. One step after another. There must be a way out of this thicket. Hello? 
Hello? Is there somebody out there? Oh, shit. No, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Not the fire. Please. God, not the holy mom. Don't let it end this way. No. No. Get up. behind and stage has to try to cover up for this again? I don't think we're that bad, are we? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're actually quite quite good. We started yeah, like, like 50 high. minutes late, so it's not that bad. So yeah, yeah, we're talking about stage and the evolution, how it, how it developed. Yeah, um, if you see um, the previous of the light, which was the last show, it was, yeah, it was a uh, development that started like 15 years ago. And 15 years ago, this uh, Papa Joe took uh, place on this thing you see on the screen right now. It's four meter wide, one meter deep, uh, one meter 20, I think, high. Uh, it could barely hold three people playing on knees on mattresses that we uh, snatched from the youth hostel. And um, the three thing things in front of it, this is all the lighting, it's just yeah. It was light on, light off. This well, thing light here, on, yes. Light off. Basically, like three light bulbs. <laughs> that was light it was three this. light bulbs and some uh, fixtures that you we probably brought from our bed stands. And um, yeah, that was lighting. And back then, it was just playing to um, uh, acting to back uh, to playbacks. This is uh, Icebox's personal masturbation cabin. Yeah. <laughs> and they took it away <laughs> from me. It was it was a perfect place for a hidden cattle pile. Yes, so you can see the, the hand puppets we used back then, and we basically did like the lip syncing for music. Yeah. So this is year seven, this is a year later. So this is the first show that had a, or tried to have a story. Yes. And um, yeah, we realized quickly that playing on our knees for more than, I'd say 15 minutes, give you really, really pain. Uh, so we tried different things. So this is a half height stage that goes a little already in the direction that we have. Yes, and it integrated with the main stage with yeah. the new. And but we do have professional lighting. Yeah, now. this time we rented uh, pro lighting. Um, but the, the stage itself was still was uh, makeshift out of plywood and cardboard. Yeah, exactly. One year later. One year later, you see that uh, we found out it all looks better if you have a clean back, uh, black background. Um, it still is cardboard and block, uh, black cloth, but uh, we're getting slowly into the direction where we want to go. Yes. And uh, for the first time, it is something that we couldn't do before, is that we are actually mounting uh, pieces of backdrop here. So we have the logo and the map. We, we didn't have fully painted backdrops yet, but uh, we started mounting things. Yes, uh, and we're, we're skipping a half hour. This is EF10. Yes, this is EF10, and this is the first time we are using a completely built uh, stage rig, uh, where the play rail is integrated as part of the whole stage construction. Um, the save on build time was about, I'd say, one day that we saved. Yeah, at least just a day. doing this. At least a day. Um, we still had the background 
uh, stuff going on yeah, with the, with just the wanted to say that what still is unique that the back that the black back uh, it's not part of the uh, metal stage construction it was still made out of uh, uh, plywood uh, yeah. and had to be constructed and that took about like two days to build and put yeah. the cloth on and after the show was done the cloth was taken off and the wood was put in the campfire exactly so like we were, like we still do we, if we had still had a campfire going when the pop trick yeah. was we basically burn everything because we can't take it home you can see we're still mountain pieces of backdrop here yeah and you see uh, if you can sorry give me one back uh, and you see that we already started to to use um, um, we use all the, all the props on yeah. the uh, on the front yeah. and try to create scenic uh, uh, scenic effects with the fog and green lights. Yeah. So it's, um, we, we started from just having light to really um, designing light that yeah, goes exactly. with the story and having going more in a theatrical direction than just a skit show. Yeah, uh, you can see F11 here, which is basically a step of evolution, evolution of that because we have a bigger yeah. rig, obviously. <laughs> And ta-da, you can see our backdrop construction here. So this is a picture that is part of the construction. And for the first time, we're using backdrop panels. And they're yeah. going to be mounted of this thing. How did you call it again? Igor. No, that's the first that's version here. It's a backdrop. Oh, that's, yeah, backdrop. That, that's backdrop. We yeah. kept giving our uh, constructions <laughs> IKEA names. Um, so you can see you have, the really nice, you have the really nice rigging in front, and you have this makeshift plywood stuff. And this is how we would set up uh, backdrops. Uh, we would actually use pieces of plywood and kind of balance it and trying to get it all the way up. Yeah. It goes really high. And this is how it, you, uh, here, here it looks. We have actually painted uh, backdrops here, which are like full, uh, which use the, the, the full um, surface. And we're also using stuff in front, and we have the professional rig here. Yeah, but then it was two backdrop panels per scene. Yeah, yes, it was really it was, small. And that's what I still call the small stage. It was six yeah. meters, so we gone from four to six meters, which is still our rehearsal stage, yes. which makes it sometimes even more cramped on the rehearsal because on the show we have a seven meter fifty stage. In the rehearsal, we just have a six meter, and for some action, you really uh, see that it's missing the one and a half meter. Uh, especially if you pile up people for mass scenes, it gets yeah. really, really, really tight. Exactly. This one is from the Rainbow Hotel. Yes. So that's when it got so complicated that we actually had to make a drawing where we couldn't make it from uh, from uh, from our just minds again. Because we had a very low ceiling and we had to come up with a construction that we can both play and that people can still see. So we make a little diagram here where you can see uh, how people how people's view are and where we need to put the backdrops so they can see them. Because if you put them to low, that it will be cut off for, for the majority of viewers. And uh, I think this is the, uh, the the first row of people. As well. Yes, the people in the first row to see everything. Yeah, because um, what you uh, the, the the problem you have or the problem, but the thing that you have to uh, see that uh, the people in the front they have to see the most important parts of the puppet. So if you follow the back, so we are at FOH even sitting on a little podest. We have a perfect view of the scene, but the people in the first row, they have to look all the way up. And so if I have, if the angle isn't set right, I just see the ears of the main character for the whole show. And exactly. that's not what we want. So we have to really clear the angles and see if everything is visible even before we go there and build stuff. Yeah. Um, I didn't find a picture of just the pop-up stage. So you see the whole construction and see how big it's actually become. Yeah. I think that's year 15. Yeah. And you can see that the puppet show is actually the little hole at the back. And this is already a uh, this is six meter. This is it's a six meter. It's a six meter stage. So you can see that it's already six meters wide, yeah. and it's actually it's still part of the main stage. Um, the Ringberg, the Ringberg stage was ten meters. That is six meters in the middle, and exactly. the two banners. Are One of the right. biggest differences we have here now that we're no longer using that plywood construction. Yeah. We're actually using an extension of the truss. If you look at the mm -hmm. diagram again, here, here it goes. And uh, yeah, you can see the front of house. It's become a little thing. And this is, this is how we started to, uh, to mount the backdrops. We have a uh, system that we call Igor, which is basically like a V-shaped uh, receptacle that, uh, that some uh, screws uh, that we have on the back of the back of panels basically fall into. So all you need is two guys and basically roughly hitting that thing and dropping the backdrop panel and it will just hang because it has a special V-shaped hook construction that it will basically fall into. So this is a side view. What uh, I don't have, uh, what's not in this uh, diagram is the actual measurements. So from the ground up, which is 
where just the player not came up. Uh, to the top of the play rail, which it says Sichtlinie, which is the sideline, um, that would be about one meter sixty already. Yes. So with all these angle compensation, the um, uh, the lower part of the panel, which is the last panel actually, yeah. yeah, there. So this is the lowest part. This will be roughly at one meter eighty, one meter ninety, and then we're adding another one meter and twenty of backdrop panel. So the hook up there is somewhere around three meters high. So um, this is quite a task to put on. Yeah, yeah, it takes some strength. Um, it's the wrong direction. This is how the, the stage for just soil looks are used. Yeah. So you don't see much of that. You all, all you know is that things look nice. You can actually see them and you can play on them. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of consideration that goes into that. Okay. We move we move on to the uh, to the maritime hotel. Yes, bigger stage, bigger venue, bigger everything. Uh, now we're going to seven meter fifty stage. And they already have a stage basically. And they already have a twenty fucking meter stage in there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, the stage was so huge that uh, we said, okay, we're just building our puppet stage on top of the main stage. Um, so yeah, you, you, you can see that it's entirely uh, that is entirely uh, independent. It's basically uh, its own stage within the stage. You can see yeah. that the lights are in the process of being set yeah. up, so you can see it all raw. It will be will be covered later. And yeah. one nice thing that the maritime stage has was these yeah. lifts pull them up and move them down. That yeah, the, the Maritime has a, had a real theatrical stage, uh, so they had this uh, electric lift rails that yeah. all the lights and scenery elements uh, get attached to. Uh, something that we're lost here again. And Igor. And yeah. Igor, yeah, we also mounted our backdrop panel on this. No, no, this, this was then Igor light, because we don't need an extra construction for it. It was just attached to the, to the flights. Yeah, so these are basically bars that you can move up and down through this, uh, through these wires. Cables, yeah. And uh, this is the back of uh, the, uh, the stage. You can, this still, is you can still say the numbers. Here's the number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we don't mix up the, uh, the sequence of things. So it's basically still the same construction, but it's much more convenient now because we can let everything down. Yeah, and, and with, uh, with this, um, the whole uh, lighting concept got more and more complex because now we're lighting two different uh, layers. Uh, we, lay, uh, we light from front, we lay, uh, light from top, it's the same yeah. with the second layer. We go I, I, have a, I, I have a couple of slides for the layers. Okay, yeah. We can show it. This is how it looks when the volume is on it, and it looks simple again. You basically have just a hole in the wall where people start playing puppets, and it looks easy. And that's how yeah. it's supposed to look like. And with the lights on, it looks like this. Yes. Yeah, we really like that. And now we are at the S trial last year. And boy, this, this, it was taking place in this room, and we had all the main rig, uh, all the dance rig, all the puppet rig in the same room, and it was like a mixture of everything we had before. Yeah, first time I laid my measurement in here, I said, okay, this is going to be, be really, really small. I can barely fit the puppet stage onto this, into this box here. Um, you have a side view up here, and this yeah. is basically the main stage, and you're actually right now sitting on the main stage. That's where it was built. It was like uh, several meters going yeah, in so front of this stage. So we just doubled the depth of the stage to fit the pulpit stage behind yeah. a normal performance stage. Yeah. You have a side view here. The, the audience is looking this way from here. Yeah. And you can see the main rig and you can see the pulpit rig and no more lifts. We actually had to hoist up things ourselves again. Um, you can see it on the top view here. This is the pulpit stage. This is the main stage and the curtain is actually here. We are sitting here right now. And, and, you, here right and you can see that even I include the numbers in my drawings. Yeah. You can see a picture from construction here. So this is the actual stage that is being built in front of this. Yeah. And this is the stage we are sitting right now. We're sitting about here. And you can again see the provincial trussing. And what makes uh, lighting and everything very complex is that we have three levels in each scene uh, that we're going to talk about. We are, I, I, to, to illustrate this, um, to make, uh, to make you understand why it is so complicated. We have a scene uh, from the EF90 show here, and you can see that the scene is compromised of three levels. You have the actual uh, stage level, the play, we call it the play rail, I have no, that's even a word, uh, where the characters move most of the time. Then halfway in, we have level number two. So we have uh, backdrops basically standing in the middle, and characters go behind and in front of it. Or on top. Or, or on, on top. top, yes. 
and you have uh, level number three, that is the actual backdrops. And uh, normally characters can't be behind that, but squid, you have that. Yes. <laughs> and um, uh, that very same scene uh, from a 3D perspective. This is like a bird's eye view. You see the containers in the back, you see the three cable roads in the back, and you see uh, the, the play rail in the front. So you can have like puppets run up here, hide behind this, and come back into view this way. And this is how it would look from the back, if you could see it. You can see the characters here. And they're right now hiding behind the cable roads. And it's one, again, the first level, the second level, and the third level. And what makes this, uh, yeah, we, we have the same thing on the stage that we did here last year, so we have the same side view that we just had. <coughs> so the actual play rail is here. All the second level stuff will be mounted here, and the actual backdrops are going to be mounted here. And if you wonder why we have a second roll of protests, <coughs> uh, it is of this angle uh, thingy that I have drawn the same thing for this stage and say, okay, we need to have some protests in there, otherwise uh, everything you play further back yeah. people will not see. Now the complicated thing is that we have one stage that does everything. You have to have the regular stage shows, you have the dances, you have the pop show, and uh, the rig you build basically must accommodate all three kinds of music. And, as we all just learned, uh, the puppet show uses three levels of lighting. Each of these three levels have separately lighted. Because sometimes we have stuff standing there, sometimes we don't, sometimes in the dark backdrop, and you have different uh, different colors of that. Yeah, in, in the picture you just sh uh, showed, it is already three different light levels. You have yes. to have the front where the characters are. You want to have light there because you want to see the character. Then the second one there is the uh, the street light, so you don't want to have extra light on there, which causes street light in itself lights and creates exactly. the mood for the scenery. You can see that the, the backdrops are lighted blue. And then you want to have the backdrops blue because we're in a night scene and want to have a little bit of moonlight on there. Exactly. So if you want to have all stuff in one rig, this is basically a bird's eye view of this uh, of this room and the next room and the room afterwards. And uh, you can see all the different trussing that is used for dances and everything. And now let's put in the light fixtures. This is how it goes. Every little box here that you can see is actually a lamp that has to be planned for, it has to be connected. We have to um, take into consideration how much power it needs so it doesn't blow the brackets. And it has to be <coughs> assigned channels on our lighting board. And uh, I've zoomed in here so you can see just the amount that uh, our puppet show needs. This is basically, uh, to a large extent, every of the symbols is a piece of light with the puppet show. <coughs> Sorry for that. Yes. Um, 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 how are the lights controlled? Well, it's a very simple system. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a system that is called DMX. It's uh, called uh, digital, digital multiplex. It's something that has been invited, I think, in the 80s. And um, basically, devices and lights are daisy chained. So you have one control cable running from your controller to your first lamp. From there, it goes to the second lamp. From there, it goes to the third lamp. It goes on like that. And theoretically, you can have like 512 lamps on one on one cable. Um, it's exactly the, the kind of setup that this stage uh, uses at the moment. Uh, the Swiss puppet show, which are going to uh, who are going to have their show uh, today here, they are the kind uh, to let us use their stage and their equipment to have this little talk. And um, ma maybe uh, maybe Tana will could give you a little demonstration of how it works. It's really simple. Basically, uh, every one of these lights get a number assigned. There's actually switches on each of these things where you can say this one is number one, this one is number five, this is number ten. And uh, I wanted to show you this on camera, but my cable is too short, so you have to look back there at Sanabo and see what he's doing. Is the cable enough for you to actually show everybody the pages, or will it just uh, break everything? Uh, let's see. Maybe so like at, this. At, at very simple, if you're using like a control desk like this. So it's a very simple show, and you like you can turn on the, the, the colored lights, and each of the faders he's moving is basically uh, turning on or dimming the lights that have the number assigned that the fader has. So that's the basic principle of, of things. Oh, there they are. Yeah. 
so we can turn it on and off different uh, different lights that you have assigned to the, the fader. Now imagine imagine the diagram I just showed you. That was like uh, I don't know how many lights there are. There's like a couple of hundred lights. So you obviously don't want to put everyone on a different fader because we're running out of fingers really fast. So we have a more complicated light desk uh, at the actual show where you can like program scenes and go like that. And you can basically say, I want scene one, I want scene two, and you will uh, memorize the different uh, light setups that, that you have. It's kind of what you have with the sound just for lighting. Yes. If you are very curious, uh, you can have a look at the uh, lighting desk that we're using at the main stage over there. As long as you don't touch everything, it's out in the open, you can look at it. Um, if you've already volunteered for doing some lighting uh, during the dances, you probably know already a little bit of how it works. And um, yeah, this is all I'm going to tell you now because it would get really, really technical. Uh, yeah. I just want to make you realize that we really have an awful lot of lights to control. And uh, if something in that setup doesn't work, it really, really contributes to the, to the delay we have. You have a question? Is there a way to link the audio software that you're using to the lighting software? Theoretically, so yes. Will loop the other if you're deciding to do yeah. a loop it, it would be possible to do it, but uh, and in, a, uh, in a big real feed environment, you would do it. So you would have a lighting designer design the show, program the show, and then it would run on a time control. Uh, but uh, since we don't have the facility, like work in the stage for like two weeks to uh, to install the show, uh, we go with uh, going a two-person operation where everyone is responsible for the timing of its part of the show. Yeah. And, uh, I just dug up a couple of numbers from the EF20 setup that was the, the last one in the. Thank you. <laughs> for, uh, was last for the uh, for the Marriott team. Uh, back then we had 684 different control channels controlling 147 fixtures and uh, if we put everything on full on making it really really bright we are we maxed out that 102,000 watts just lighting. Planning, yeah. planning these th stuff took about, I would say, four months. And yeah, not drawing the papers, but having all the talks, all the details, uh, all the people know what they have to do. And uh, yeah, building it, it takes four days. Yeah, and if it's finished, it looks like this. Yep. And every gun goes like, ooh. And you go like, ah, this is oh, so, I'm so glad it's finally finished that it works. <clears throat> and it, it's really hard to make this work. Um, yeah, uh, I think next up we're going to talk just briefly about sound, how it works. Yeah, we, I think we covered a great deal of the sound stuff. Um, basically, um, Cheater has the software, his own cue system software that plays out the sound. And it doesn't come in just a stereo pair. So um, he's given me um, eight stereo, uh, forged stereo pairs, that's eight channels. So everything from here up to here. Uh, it's just the playout sampler, and I have like dialogues that are pre-recorded. I have two channels of sound effects, the ambience that we talked earlier, and the score. So uh, if uh, some piece uh, of the dialogue gets very dramatic, I can emphasize this with uh, adding the score. To it. The keepers are coming, the keepers are coming. So you Quick, have the make sure you're home when they come, or you won't get your presents. Do you know what you're going to get? I want a rocking horse. Yeah. I'm going to get my own hunting knife. How do you know? I just know. And I also know what you are going to get. Oh, tell me. No, oh, I know you're a telltale. I'm not, I won't. I swear, not even mom. Come on. And what's that from me? Snowbell, some treasure. Get your little party behind over here right now. Think, I'm uh, coming, mommy. If, if Wait for me. You really can't hear like uh, the, the the speech or the microphones are too low. You can always adjust the score, the ambience, the sound effects that are not right here, and also some of the voices are actually pre-recorded, being running out of actors sometimes or out of microphones so that are single lines that are pre-recorded. Um, you are using these two channels over here. So uh, the very interesting thing about how we do this is that uh, the software I've showed you all, you actually plays out all the different things on different channels. And uh, you can actually change the mix on the fly to see how it works in a big room and how the actors 
I'll, I'll walk you about it. This is cool. We should just leave this on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah right. that, that's the way sound works. <laughs> that's the way live sound works. It also lo looks very, very easy, but uh, you have like dialogue going over the score and you have to duck down the score so you can hear the dialogue because otherwise the dialogue will be just overwritten by the, by the sheer amount of sound that you yeah. have. Yeah, and uh, we cut it down on the playback channels. I mean, we now have about four pairs. Um, a couple of years ago, we did four channels around. So that added another two pairs uh, for surround channels for the SFX and the ambiences. Yep. So I kind of needed a full desk just to mix down the, um, the backing score for the show. And then we added like six, seven, eight live microphones. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's much bigger than this one, but the principle of operation is the same. We are basically mixing every part of the score that I showed you earlier um, live uh, there. Now I'm losing a little bit track. Uh, we are on the last page. <laughs> um, yeah, I have to look at my own notes, which was just going to, 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 to be next. Um. Yeah. It stopped playing the sound right there. <laughs> it really doesn't like us. We, we decided to show some stuff that uh, we think is really cool. <coughs> oh, that if we can do with, uh, with uh, stage technology. Yeah. It hates me. It doesn't like to play it. <coughs> Just let, let me shut down all the other things that are going in. That's, I think uh, SDS is it's probably, hogging, it's probably yeah. hogging my computer. Uh, so uh, did I close it? It's closed down, right? Yeah, this nice is a sound queue system software, as nice as it is, sometimes it gives you a <laughs> 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 I've for how long I've been working in this company, but if it was for other than five minutes, it's America, I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> this shows you uh, very nicely what you can do if you have stage <laughs> 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 Like you can uh, set a light and elevate it. when nobody expects it. <laughs> you just have to make the plants appear. <laughs> Derek didn't remember that one. <laughs> This is, this is how we used the same effect. Uh, it was a very nice thing that we were able to use at the Maritime Hotel and we can't use anymore. The black things you see peeking out on top of the panels, these are the, the hooks that the ego attaching the panels to. Yeah. What? No! Oh! Oh! Baby! We read parts of the back from Google also, it was like a if, if you listen to it, where uh, her voice gets louder and then there's the big ambience reverb, that, that's a, something that's not loud. So we're still letting you pray, and it works. You don't like to play this part, but I should not. Then, uh, while we are showing up, uh, showing off. This is uh, a thing I recorded myself until it's a little bit jerky. So uh, you see a little bit how uh, this is our backstage monitor where we can actually, from the front of house, we have like an infrared monitor that shows us what's going on behind the stage and telephones. And uh, what we did is we set up uh, for the EF uh, 18 show, no, 18, 17, 17 show. 17. We uh, set up a little hidden stage that was just observed by a mirror. Here. This is our little hidden stage, and we used it to put live, uh, live stuff that was supposed to uh, take place on, on the projection screen. Secret government uh, uh, was actually to play live. But be aware, this on the projection screen. As I am allowed to be to your new emperor for all, the responsibility of making sure something like this can never happen again is in your hands. So he had a his own hidden stage that he couldn't see with a little... Your freedom is a fundamental human right. And he was, he was supposed to do it via, uh, via Skype or video, video conferencing. 
And sorry? I wish you all a wonderful night. I'm sorry. Take care, my friends. Uh, I, can't, I can't hear my own voice. I'll give you another explanation. Um, so this was a little stage that was hidden behind the real stage and was filmed by a little surveillance camera. And we had uh, one of the characters come in live via telephone, basically. And uh, we had him act live on that second stage so everything would keep in sync and we could like improvise and, uh, and uh, properly act. And this is the little stage we built there. And uh, the, the video at first showed you how I was walking behind the stage and showing you uh, where actually it was located. And, and you can see by the keyboard how small the stage is actually. Yep. It's about as, as wide as, uh, as null is, maybe double the size of null, and a meter in the back. And there was Tiger's Eye and me sitting there <laughs> in the stage. And I was basically, I was leaning on, on him. He was leaning on the back of the stage, I was leaning on him, and then we were playing inside the stage. Here you can oh. see how you, yeah. Here you can make how you make uh, soap bubbles float up. The problem with soap bubbles as a replacement for bubbles in water is that usually they float down because they are heavier than air. But what we wanted is actual bubbles floating up. So we built a bubble machine that first is with helium instead. That's what you could see uh, uh, before that. So I'm, I'm going to go back. Uh, sorry. I'm going to back to that scene. So you can see that we have a big bottle of helium here and a hose that goes to the bubble machines and we actually modified it so it would fill bubbles with helium so they would float up and they would put like UV reactive paint in them so you could see them in the bath, which caused the biggest mess I have ever seen. <laughs> but they will eventually burst and will have like UV fallout over all the stage and the actors can see the UV lights uh, on the bottom here. And in the end it looked like this. So it's, it's that little details that really take a lot of attention. But they float up, they look like water bubbles. <clears throat> air bubbles, yeah, air bubbles in water. And then of course something you really like to brag about is the air reactor thing that we had last year. I'm going to show you some construction pictures later. But this thing had its own lighting, it could move up and down, and you could play puppets in it from below. And of course, it made for the most epic dying scene we've ever done. <laughs> and again, you can see what a different Proximus form makes. I want to direct, I want to actually uh, direct this. Yeah. You need a conductor's uh, yes. a stick for that. Okay, uh, I'm going to stand up for this one so people can finally see me while we, we get through this presentation. Um, last part I want to talk about is production design, and that is everything that is not a puppet and that is not part of the stage. So we have these descriptions uh, that are in uh, in the script that will take you, uh, that will basically tell you how how you're going to imagine that scene. But it's definitely not enough description for anybody to build a scene. Um, so here we have the main light core control room. That's the fusion reactor. This is both reactor chamber and main control room. Convenient located right next to each other. Start back start. The back wall is filled with blinking lights and computer screens. The scene is dark. Possibly use of UV. On the second level, there is a platform with a huge control console. There. The control console has a holder for a keeper staff in the middle. There is a small keypad and a video console near the entrance. And how are you supposed to build this? And um, this is when Tiny Real comes in. Because uh, probably must be at the beginning, she is uh, helping us and doing uh, sketches for how uh, the stage setup is going to work. And these are composites. Actually, it's three layers in Photoshop. Uh, but I'm just going to show it here. And uh, what is on the front layer actually has these green outlines. And this tells how the backdrop panels are going to be painted. This is one of those backdrop panels. This is the, the second backdrop panel. And. Um, this is, uh, this is the third one, and um, yeah, um, this, this is basically what we use as, uh, as the basis for building uh, stuff that is put up on the second and the third level. Usually, we, I draw this with Tanya and we send it to Icebox, he says, no, 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 you've got to have everything the wrong way around, it's not <laughs> left, it's right, and, this gets, gets, and we make our corrections, and, um, and uh, you can see how it actually works. Um, we have basically one week to get these backdrops, uh, one weekend to get these backdrops finished because it takes a lot of work and you gather around all the, all the volunteers you can find, as many artists you can find, and you show them these kits and said, go. Because um, 
if you if you uh, talk about this, um, it's it's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, when we meet at this weekend and we have all the volunteers there, usually uh, this is a few scenes that you see. Everyone starts building the stuff that you can't build during rehearsals. So uh, Tio and, and uh, company are building uh, the reactor here right now. Uh, we have some camo nets that are going to be uh, the, the forest. Um, we have some printed things like this is one of the glass stained windows that we're going to have. Um, so uh, we need to stick that on. Um, some, some backdrop panels like these uh, are going to have holes in them. And uh, here right now we are cutting out parts of what is going to be a door. And uh, as you can see, the material we're using is like uh, medium density fiber boards. So it's like the thing that you need uh, when you're building a cupboard and you want back wall. That's basically that kind of cardboard we're using. And we paint on that because it doesn't wrinkle. You can easily transport it and it's really cheap. Actually cheap. And it holds all kinds of paint that you yeah. might have. Um, here is stick stick paper on it. Exactly. Uh, here you see, here you see uh, uh, Luno painting one of the backdrop images. Oh. And um, as you can see, one of these things is like uh, 1 meter 20 by 2 meter 40. Um, three of these make one scene. We have up, up to 12 scenes. So uh, worst case is we need 36 of them all painted. Quite obviously, this is too much work for one weekend. So usually we try to make it as simple as possible. Like we, we have gaps in the scene where nothing is. Or if it's hidden by something on the second level, we just leave it out. And if it's possible, we recycle them. So we have like we ship them uh, one panel and we just add one. Or we have the same scenery going twice. Well, like last year in the first scene, we don't have a backdrop at all. Yes, exactly. We just leave out the lights, which is the easiest part. Everyone goes like, how oh, much backdrop that scene? None. Yes. Next. <laughs> so th this is basically one of our backdrop building weekends and you can see there's like activity all over the place. Uh, we have couple, uh, usually one or more artists who are there coordinate the whole thing. Um, it's, uh, it's usually uh, Risa, our backstage manager, who helps coordinating this. They usually make a printout of all the, uh, of all the sketches. Mm -hmm. Uh, to take with them, and uh, usually we have someone who's uh, extremely uh, like like professional artist. Like on on the left you see Henrique, uh, on the right you see Blue Panther, and they actually they know how to paint. So they're giving instructions to all the volunteers, and they are basically drawing outlines. They color this green, color this red, color this blue, and uh, then they will later fill in the details about this. And uh, well, yeah, we're using these backdrop panels. Um, that are made of cardboard. And before you start painting on them, you actually have to prime them and give them a base color. And uh, so if you have to do this to like 30 panels, it takes a while. So over uh, recorded this little time lapse where you can see <laughs> what happens when you, when you have to prime all these panels. And uh, I think uh, usually like half a day or a full day is just spent. Half a day, about, yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it takes a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, this is how it works. Next up, I'm going to show you some comparisons. Uh, on the top, you see the sketch, and on the bottom, you see how it's actually been done. So um, the, the sketch doesn't show as many details, but it shows where everything is going to be and what colors are supposed to be used. And uh, you can see uh, the, the living room down here is actually on the second level, so you can walk behind it. These blue backdrops have completely different lighting, as you can see, because they are on the third level. So they have the outside light, uh, the, the blue outside night light, and uh, the, the inside part is on the second level that has a different kind of lighting there. But it's pretty, pretty close to the sketch. Same here. As you can see, uh, the character is walking behind the second level, which is marked here with the green outline. The same with the, with the tree stuff where someone comes out. Or here, which is actually marked on the first and second level, so you can walk in between them. Um, here's another scene. It actually has the same colors, but the lighting uh, changes the colors because it's in the night. And uh, another one, you can see that uh, we basically told everyone, okay, there's, there's supposed to be some cages here, and then we took actual uh, bunny cages and put them up here as our lab testing cages. And uh, for the first time, we are also using backlighting. So we have holes in the backdrops and another set of lighting, which is our fourth level now. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, you can actually walk behind these um, because we have like a podium that goes behind the backdrop. Because you no longer have lifts, you actually have to hang them. And uh, we built them in a way that you can walk up the platforms and you can actually put on the panels from behind. So you don't have to lift like three meters high. The nice thing about this is uh, that you can now have another level of lighting, which is our fourth level. And you can have uh, shine through windows like this one. You saw a uh, VP preparing the printed, uh, uh, the printed foil earlier. And you can see we have a fourth level character playing here that you can only see the shadow of. Because he's <coughs> in prison and she is hiding behind the window and she's going like, Psst, I'm over here. <coughs> you can just see the, the shadow moving. And uh, this is Blue Petter being all professional. And yeah, this is just another example of a, of a, of a see through thing. Um, yeah, you can see some construction pictures of the reactor I, I, I showed you earlier in various stages. It had its, its own lighting built in that was also controlled by DMX. So there was an extra, basically, I, th I think it was an extra universe just controlling this one. So basically it's only a cabin there. These Chinese cans here were a bitch to control. And uh, yeah, that's our first test how it looks with the lights on. Yes? Sure. Here. Yes, fire away. Did you really uh, use a, a complete collective tube for the entire reactor? Yes. yes. It was, uh, you can see it here, it was like a complete ring. It was like a bent uh, kind of plastic. Yeah, it wasn't a tube it, it, to begin with, it was a flat sheet. And we uh, rolled it, it up. To I, I was wondering where to get such tubes. Yeah, it was just a, a flat sheet and we rolled it up yeah. and uh, closed, closed the seam in the back somewhere in the, where the where these uh, um, support beams are, so you can't see it. And the um, tubing on top, the, the orange tubing on top, has lots of cable ties on it. It goes round and round, it just keeps it in yeah. shape. This is how it works. We put the lighting in, we did the test. Um, nice thing is, another thing that, that is pretty important uh, is stuff like this. Um, next build this, and he went completely overboard with the details because it was originally in the script supposed to be like a painted piece of cardboard and it was only used like for 30 seconds. Yeah. And he spent an entire day building this. And we said, okay, you built a nice movie prop. I really adore it, but it's going to be in there really short. And he saved it and he's keeping it in his living room right now. <laughs> and we think it's awesome. It took a lot of time, but yeah, this is another important prop. A prop is anything that is movable on stage, everything that a character can take. And um, like one of the lights, yeah, that's, that's actually the original one. Um, it's, it has LED lights in it. Sometimes we build light into props because lights coming from the stage is much more realistic than the kind of uh, light that comes on the stage. So if we can, uh, uh, we can, we, we try to make things light up that actually light. Like we have a street light, we put light in it. Um, and uh, this is one of the magic lights of the keepers of the light. So obviously we want it to be a light. Um, Tio is keeping like a whole one euro store at his home. This is the stuff he collects and that we build props out of. And it's, it's basically just a few cents each and you never know what you're going to use it for. So he's basically boxes and boxes of stuff. And when we come up with ideas for props, uh, he's going to build it or he's going to write the parts. Sometimes you have to be very careful what you write in your script. So at one point I wrote in the script and then some chickens are running around for atmosphere and people actually started building animatronic chickens. And uh, I never knew until they were there. I was like, what the heck are the chickens? And they said, it's right there in the script. I was like, holy fuck. I, uh, how much time did you spend on these? It's like, oh, a couple of days. Like, oh, I need to be more careful with writing stuff like this. And then the most epic light show begins. And here the most epic light show begins. That's another, another line from my script. And he wrote the most epic light show. Then. So it kind of works. Sometimes you can't just put everything into the script. I think um, if you know the first part of the Lord of the Rings where they're crossing the bridge of Kizadum and you have this long fighting scene with the battle rock that comes up and the, and, the, uh, and the bridge that breaks down, in the script it just says, and the battle rock attacks them while they cross the bridge. That's yeah. right. And uh, yes, sometimes you just have to plan things differently than the script. This is a really nice prop that was easy to make. It was just a, a, sh a small fire extinguisher and he uses it to cool, cool down the two people fighting. And uh, it basically costs nothing, but it makes that really nice fog effect, so we use that, because it's uh, like spitting out CO2. Um, not sure if you can see this on the, on the projection. 
One thing that lights up is uh, like these electric shock rods uh, that the keepers of the light use. And they have like a flash bulb in it, uh, or really bright LED, and a little microcontroller that controls the flashing and stuff like that. And there's a, a button on the stuff uh, where you can make them light up. And uh, at the same time, I always have like my finger on the sound bill going pssst when, when, they, when they work like that. Yeah, another nice pop goes like doo -doo 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 -doo. I think you, you heard it in my, in my demo. It's one of the comedic things, and uh, he's getting beaten up over the head with that, with that thing. Yeah, this is one of the human remains they find. It's like a, a, a big burnt up poster, like Attack of the 50 Feet Women, and it shows that they obviously used to be like a human civilization, and they're taking that for granted. Like, oh, humans, they've been like 50 feet great, and they must have been the, the, the mystic figures that ruled dreams. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's that's about the production design. Um, we have a long list of of, of props. Um, usually, um, when we, we usually uh, Risa and Sefiro go through the script and they compile a list of props that are supposed to be made, and uh, they both supervise. They they basically assign props to both. We have that long list of props, and they go like, "Who volunteers?" And then everyone runs away. And uh, yeah, we we eventually get this stuff built. So uh, we don't have really have a process for it. Basically, everyone whose time has to build has to build props. Um, um, yeah, there's there's not much to tell about that. <laughs> okay, yes, uh, Risa is up here with me now at the moment because um, one of the things we are going to try if you have the patience, and it's probably going to go really, really wrong. We're going to lose this, uh, use the Swiss pop show stage and we're going to try to play the first scene of last year's show for you with what have we have left of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be like our first rehearsal. <laughs> Basically, it's because we've all forgotten how to play it and we have like four meters instead of eight. And It's about the right height. Yes, uh, we don't have all the props and the snap jaw I had, uh, we had to disassemble it to transport it. It's missing some of the electronics. It's going to be fun because we haven't played this in a year and we will see how it works without rehearsing. I hope everybody has a readable version of the script somehow. If not... You will have to make up. Uh, you will have to make up your uh, your dialogue. Um, yeah, but actually, actually, when we when we got through all the rehearsals and we have all the props and the script is finished and we have all the sound effects and the lighting has been planned and the lighting has been built, the dress rehearsal is the first time we get to try it, <laughs> which leads to um, a lot of surprises. Yeah. Oh, indeed, indeed, and every stage is new. Every year we get something different. And that's what yeah may take some time. Yes, if you ever running where we have like a three hour delay, it's because things fuck up and you don't see it coming. Um, yeah. So oops. <laughs> yeah, so can I then have the properties please for Michael Jack on day four? Yeah, that's what we do on, on dress rehearsal. Also, it's like uh, okay, we get our microphone packs, everything set up because we are playing with it. Uh, yeah. uh, with the headset microphones because you can't hold your script and your microphone and your puppet it basically yeah, it's really not going to work so you need something like this and we're going to check if everything works and uh, change batteries and then we go behind the stage and one of them fails mm -hmm. always yes. so we the moment you're trying to plug in spares. the fog machine something you try to plug in the fog machine and you find out that there is not actually a socket to plug it into because there is no socket at this place of the stage. Someone was supposed to put it there, but it's not there. And somebody is running for an extension cable. And it just takes time to find out how that works. Yeah. So we're leveling, leveling the microphones. That's the first thing the first thing we do before the show. Sometimes we're doing it uh, before each scene. Sometimes uh, everyone reads a line from the script before the curtain actually opens. Luckily in this scene we're going to play we only have two streaming roles. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we chose the scene with as few actors as possible. So, we're still playable here. And I'm going to miss, mess up yeah. all the sound cues. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah.
We're trying how the dialogue level between those two works. I spoke. Huh? I'm here. I can see you. Yeah, you can see me. I can't. Well, that's okay. I can't see you as well. <laughs> uh, I ask for it. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yes, there I am. Yeah. So do you have your script, everything ready? Yeah, of Okay, course. microphone checked. Do you? Yes, I do. I don't have it with me right now, you can see that. So well, yeah, obviously. Okay. 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 And we have a light, so you're yes. safe. Great. Yeah. My great hero in the... It's really easy Lying. because we have only two microphones level. Uh, at, in some scenes we have like eight, because everybody is speaking. Say a few words about that picture. Hello, you're cute. Okay, what you can see is the preparations going on before the show starts. Oh. We have a team which only takes care that all the props are in one place and all the actors know where to find them. We also have, uh, let's say for the Pompeii show, we had a separate team which only takes care of the clothing for the puppets. When they have to change clothing between the scenes, they do only this. And believe me, we try to fit a pull over to one of the puppets, so it's going to take ages. You can try it later, actually. We have some clothing here, and you can try putting it on a puppet. <laughs> okay, so um, we also check um, are all the puppets used required for this scene really on stage? And we also check do they have their props? And as you can see, one prop is missing, so I'll do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, what you, did you talk about the slide because I was, uh, I was distracted? That's one of the things. Uh, Risa is, is the backstage manager and uh, she's right now making sure everyone's at the right position and knows where to play and they're trying to fit everything in into the space they have there. Uh, <laughs> If, if you want, uh, there is a lighting built in here, uh, yeah, but I don't know where. Swiss puppeteer team, how to switch on the light? The reading light lights. Mm -hmm. Help. Help. Yep, we need the guy who pulls up the light just because we don't know which lighter it is. There is a light strip that is mounted in yeah. here so that people can <laughs> read from their scripts even when the lights are off. No. And no, 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 we are figuring out how to, how to turn that on. Another thing uh, that Riza needs to do is uh, she needs to keep track on which scenes con consist of which, um, which backdrops and where they are going to put up. You see the setup of the underwater scene that we've seen uh, uh, last time. This field up here is reserved for backdrop panels. It doesn't have any because the actual stage that is playing on is empty. And you can see this is the stage and uh, the underwater scenery is actually put up before the stage. And here is a diagram of the main stage where everything is going to be set up. And uh, they have this as a part of a script where each uh, page is a different scene. So the people setting up behind all the stuff know where to put it. And uh, yes, uh, I have some, some pictures from last year because we usually do the dress rehearsal. Uh, on one day, it's usually Wednesday evening and it usually takes the entire night because it really doesn't go fast because you have to adjust so many things. Because it's the first time we have the full lighting room. It's the first time we have all the sound effects. It's the first time we have the microphone set up you plan for. It. And um, with a professional theater production, you'd actually rehearse on the stage that you're going to play it. And we can't afford that because everything is rented. Built weeks before. Yes. Uh, we're, we're trying to approximate the actual stage, but yeah, we can't. Uh, last year we had a big problem. Uh, my PC blew up. Uh, we had stuff at the stage that didn't, go, that didn't go right because we didn't have enough time to set up the lighting. And we ended up having like a deadlock situation where everyone kept waiting on everyone else and basically everyone was fixing problems. And um, yeah, it got later and later and it was like four in the morning and five in the morning and eventually it was like eight in the morning and we decided we can't do this. We have technical problems, we can't rehearse it. And now the regular comic programming starts and we have no idea how to fix that. So we basically reserved all the free slots of the stage programming we had and we made a list of priorities of things that need to be done to make the, the show work. And uh, every uh, spare minute that was on the stage was used by us to either try out the backdrops or um, what else did we, we do? Rehearse, rehearse the scenes where a lot of people are involved. Yes, we just rehearsed bare most important things where the choreography is. 
training ones is scary. But the choreography is, is, is hard and stuff like that. But last year, we ended up playing the entire show completely like without a dress rehearsal. We never rehearsed it on the stage we had. We just said we have to wing it. We had no choice. We, we put like nine months of work into the show and we, we had a problem with the setup that we couldn't solve. And so, yeah, with three hours delay, we barely made everything work, or at least we thought it works. We tested uh, the most important things, and we basically went on stage. We said, "Go, let's play it." Just you, you know how the scene goes. <laughs> so basically, what we're doing now, exactly. So usually, um, Cheetah is not right in front of the stage, obviously. He's way back there. Yeah. And our communication is via a telephone, just for the stage. And what I do, I ask one question backstage. Puppeteer is ready. Puppeteer is ready. I call Cheetah. Hello, Cheetah. Hello. This is backstage. We are ready. Yep. Uh, we have probably power cycled the, the cameras. Like it. We have put up a makeshift camera up there and a television up there. So uh, there's a more than zero chance that I, I can see what is going on because we have the stage behind us. And uh, the camera has decided it's in a shop now and wants to play the demo. So uh, I have no idea if you can turn that off. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, oh yes, one thing I might try. This give you a little view of what is actually going on behind the stage. Do you have a backstage camera here? Uh, I, I'm trying to improvise. Mm -hmm. uh, you <laughs> say, how <are> you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh gosh. They're still trying to find the position, so. Uh, we set this up and uh, no, <laughs> someone took off the extension. So much for that, so I can't show you what's going on behind there. What's planned that way, but it seems to care it doesn't work. So we are just closing this. Exactly, uh, I have to start this one. So that's what I usually do. I sit down here. Ah, I get my script. I said ignore all error messages because it's too late anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to see if anything goes wrong right now. Yeah. It's not start seeking view from other PC, which I don't have. So. We're not doing anything here. So yes, uh, I think sound is ready. And um, yes, Tano, can you please kill the main lights? I hope you have lid props there. Does the does the snap draw actually light up? Yes. Okay. Do the snap draws light up? Awesome. That means, well, I say go. Go. Oh gosh.
You, you filthy beast! Get the hell out of here or I'll throw you out of the asshole with my light! Yes, I'm talking to you! alone can mess with your head. My village is not far away. Can you walk? I'm sure everything will be better once you had a warm meal. No. I can't come with you. Tomorrow is the festival of lights. What are you going to tell the keepers when they see me? The festival of lights is a celebration of love. What objections could the keepers possibly have against someone giving shelter to a mother who's lost? More than you could possibly imagine. No, I can't come with you. You saved my life. You deserve better than a trouble I caused you. I've got to go. Go on and thank you. <coughs> Don't be silly. Look at yourself. I'm not going to let you die out here. This little night should be one of the best nights of the year, not your worst. You'll be safe at my house, I promise. My name's Riverson. What's yours? First Wind. Pleased to meet you, First Wind. Here, take my hand. There's a warm fire waiting for us. Thank you. Come on. This way. And curtain. <laughs> You can tell we totally messed up the cue with the snap drawer because obviously they couldn't hear the sound effects and they didn't know when they were supposed to come up. Because usually we have like a pair of monitor speakers behind the stage that will play uh, the same sound that the audience can hear. Because if you're behind the stage, you're really, really far removed from the audience and you can't really hear what is going on. And uh, so you have an extra set of speakers behind the stage so you can hear what you're actually doing. Thanks a lot, puppeteers. I, I wouldn't have expected we were playing this ever again. So, <laughs> yeah, this is probably the first time we, we are playing one part of yeah. our show more than once. I really want to play this show again now. Why didn't we do this? Because it's so much more fun if you don't have the stress. <laughs> I was so waiting for the opening titles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have the opening title on this PC, at least I don't think so. If you, if you want to see more backstage material... Well, I have um, to ask Fox to play tonight in the concert. I, because I really need this track now. <laughs> yeah, you can go on YouTube and look for a Paw Patrol backstage video. Because uh, BBF did a quite an extensive uh, uh, making of video of the uh, EF uh, 19 show. 19. Where you can see uh, footage of the, of the backstage video and everything. And uh, my PC crashing and everything that's funny to everyone but me. <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah, where we had to ha improvise half a minute of dialogue just because it, the sound PC always crashed when he played the, yeah. the cell phone ringing tone. <laughs> oh my god, yes. <laughs> oh, you, hear, you heard that and look at each other and then, okay, okay, go for it, go for it. Trying to get the cell phone back to work and trying to find out which number it was and maybe should we call back? No, we shouldn't call back. Now that's a bad idea. I think it's a good idea. And it was back and forth until he restarted his PC. 
He got back into the software, got back into the right scene, to the right cues to continue from there. <laughs> yeah, rebooting during the show really isn't much fun. <laughs> okay, we're pretty much done with this talk. And um, we have a little out of time, but I think they don't kill us if we like overrun like 10 minutes. So if you want to have a look at the puppets, yeah. Uh, good. Uh, one small thing. Uh, uh, we hope uh, you've seen it's not black magic, it's just a really shitload of work that goes into the shows. Bit of, uh, lots of creativity, obviously, but it's not dark magic or anything. Um, often people are coming uh, after the show and like, oh yeah, I wish I could do something for the show, but oh, I can't do it and whatever. Um, if you think yes, of that, you you're <laughs> wrong, basically. Um, <laughs> Until now, everyone who's joined uh, did something great to the show. And as you've seen, we always need more paws, hands, whatever you can lend. Um, so if you're interested in helping out uh, with art or playing or whatever, um, please come to us and also spread the word. We can really use a bit of help um, so we can keep on making epic shows. And make great stuff happen. And uh, it's not that one person has to do everything. It's really just we have a team of over. I think if you count the volunteers at the at the at Prop Building Weekend, I think we have a team of 50 people now who contribute to this thing. And uh, if you want to be one of those people, by all means, let me know. We are going to eat your soul. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, we have some. If you have some questions, and we should give you some answers, this would be a good time. Um, yes. Uh, I had a question about the backdrops. You backdrops. spend a lot of time painting them. Yes. Have you considered printing them on vinyl like they do it in Yes. Yes. Yeah. Actually, yeah. we did. Yeah, we, we, we tried printing a large degree to them, but we keep finding out that actually printing them is really, really expensive. Yeah. Um, because, uh, for, uh, for example, one of those uh, backdrops is roughly six meters something uh, in width and about one meter twenty in height. It's basically a large banner you need to print. And you need some mechanism that actually keeps it tight so you don't have wrinkles in it. And if it's printed on vinyl, uh, you have problems with lighting because it, it will basically reflect the lights. So what we do is we do a mixture. Uh, we like print like parts on endless paper, and we stick it on. There's a lot of backdrops, especially in the Hawaii show, where there was the, like half of the backdrops are actually printed. Almost the whole Chinese yes. Was, was yes. But uh, it, it turned it turned out it's not that much easier than you yeah. think. Actually, painting this thing can be easier, especially if all you need is basically blue backdrop and some stars on it or some trees. Uh, good artists will basically do it in, out of their wrist. So. Yeah, we were trying to print everything that needs great detail, like posters or like if you have like a column with artwork on it or something like that, we will print it. And if it's something that is done simple, like it's basically just a wall with rocks on them or trees, we will paint them because that's much easier. Any more questions? Over there. <laughs> yes, we actually had to do that. Um, if, if, if possible, yes. Um, I think we can compensate for one people, uh, for one guy or, or uh, one uh, woman getting sick, because we have like Risa and one of the women on the team. We have uh, a lot of men on the team, and uh, what we would actually do if it happens is that either, for example. Um, uh, uh, Pan once had a very sore throat and she couldn't really speak and uh, our plan B would have been her acting and uh, backstage Risa actually reading the dialogues because we can have one person acting and one other person doing the actual speaking and um, you can cover it up like that. It wouldn't have been perfect but it would have been a, a viable plan B and uh, sometimes uh, we have to exchange properties at the last moment or we have to change uh, stage hands and basically give them instructions. Like Tifio once uh, snapped his back and he, he couldn't stand anymore. And he went through all the rehearsals with us and just like an hour before the final show, he basically hurt his back and he couldn't move. And uh, someone else had to take over, which was of course very sad for him, but it kind of did work out, so yeah. If you're, if you're planning a puppet show like this, of course, it's always a little more tight than a professional production because you can't have every piece of equipment twice and replace it in case of breaks. Uh, sometimes things break that you can't fix and they're basically screwed. I think the closest call we had was when uh, Tanya had to go to hospital. Yeah. 
Yeah, Tani Mon had like uh, inflamed stomach. And she kept throwing up and he, she, he, she couldn't even keep water in. So her, her uh, condition was degrading every minute because he, she was dehydrated and she was feeling really bad and she started crying because she had to rehearse so much and oh god. Yeah, and she was, she was playing lead role and so it looked like two hours before the show that we had to swap the lead role. Yeah. And so it would have been to restart reading and some of our, yes. um, or puppeteers uh, playing the role. And of course it was devastating for her because she spent like basically one year uh, rehearsing with that uh, and, and on the very day she got sick. And we basically took our uh, one of the convention medics and we drove her to the hospital in Zulu and our medics talk, said, okay, let, let me talk with these guys. We have a different authority than you have. And they basically went to the doctor and said to him, fix her. <laughs> it doesn't matter how you get it. If you have some drugs that makes it work, and the, the doctor said, but uh, it's not the standard procedure. They go, what the standard procedure? We need her on stage like two hours from now. And they were like, well, it will be on your risk. Um, could you please sign this? <laughs> <laughs> and we signed it, and they put her on a beat drip, and they pumped her full of drugs, and within like 90 minutes, she was feeling normal. I have no idea what kind of stuff they gave her. <laughs> um, and yeah, the good stuff. I want to have some for my, for my stash. Well, and um, they said, okay, if you're going to play, the medics are going to stay nearby. So we have the medics posted on the left and on the right side of the stage and watching if Tiny would keep it over or not. <coughs> That's why obviously she wasn't really, you know, she had really recovered, but drugs were kept, helping her keep a fluid in. And so she played for the thing. It was, and she was so glad she could make it. She got lots of hugs that day, and uh, she got some really, really good sleep there. So yeah, we have to figure out ways because we're not professional. We, we can't replace everything. So far, we always managed, even with means making three hours. But we played it. Yeah, and then other stuff breaks during the show, and then it's just improvised. If stuff breaks during the show, you have to make it a joke, you know. If, if someone's weak falls off, or if there's a, is a, a, a piece of equipment that just breaks, you will have to add a bit. But the lights go out, yeah, the character will have to go, why the heck did the light just go out? You know, you have to just go play it and make it. He just flipped the wrong switch back Yeah. Boom, the lights come back Oh, someone flipped the wrong switch, yeah. You have, you have to play your way around it. Same when you, when you lose a line, you basically have to add it. So, okay. Any more questions? There was a question over there. Over there, yes. Uh, so your first 13 was my first, your first and first my first puppet show in general. And uh, at that puppet show you had all the, your own lyrics to songs from Nightwish. Oh yes, you did. Sang. And uh, from the shows I've seen so far, that was the only one that had such an extensive to it and singing. Yes. Uh, was it kind of your decision at the beginning when you thought of the seat of theme, or? Actually it was. We wanted to be, it be like, like a hard rock opera. So, uh, but that time we didn't know Fox and Moore yet. So, uh, Nightwish had put out the instrumental version of the album, and we found it exactly the same key as Hans Zimmer's score of uh, King Arthur. So we made a soundtrack that was mixed up of uh, Nightwish songs and some uh, some cues from Hans Zimmer's soundtrack of King Arthur. And I will never be able to watch that movie again, by the way. <laughs> but we took it all out of context. The nice thing about his music is it's all four bars and you can just cut and loop it however you need it. And the nice thing was that Ice Fox, who wrote basically the songs, he didn't know the originals. So he didn't know the or original melodies. So I basically gave him the playback and said, write some music to this. And he composed the melodies, which totally, completely do not match with the original Nightwish uh, melodies. We were using just the, the orchestra backing track they used. And yeah, that was a deliberate decision. And uh, we really liked that, and we did it a couple of times after that. It's a huge effort, though. Um, if you don't have anybody to upload the whole music production, I think we, we spent weeks on getting it right and making it work. But yeah. I can certainly say that since that moment, uh, the Nightwish music certainly has even more emotional value to me. It's the same to us. <laughs> that you know, put some more and everything. Would you say that in general? you would like to do something like that again? Or would you say, oh, it was nice to try, but we'll keep it without saying no? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we like the, uh, the um, uh, Hawaii-themed one that we did uh, two years ago. Uh, it had a, a, at least one song, yeah, that, that Makani song. And uh, um, 
it, it, I think it was written by you. Yes. Yeah, so Ifox wrote it, he did like a piano version of it, and... Uh, Fox uh, arranged it and made... Yes, it. and we sent that to Fox, and Fox made like the whole arrangement of it, but basically it's Ifox's composition. So, yeah, we, we do it every now and then because it's fun, but it's so much work. We, we're so glad we get it done. Pompeii one didn't have a song, as far as I remember. The Africa stuff had something. Yeah, yeah, earlier, uh, when we did the Africa theme one at EF16, uh, it had an ending song we actually wrote ourselves, yes. There was one that was wrote, written by Pinky, performed by Fairlight and Nighthawks, and I think I did the instrumental. Yeah, for Pompeii we used the auto. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we we we, we, we tend to steal music sometimes if we don't have the time to do our own. Since we know Fox and Moore is such a god's end, but we finally have our own music, and I'm, I'm deeply honored that he does this. The deal is usually he writes the music for us uh, uh, free of charge, and we try to make the best of it. And he likes seeing epic stuff being done, and then he gets to release it as an album, so he gets his money back because he's a professional musician, and he's actually spending like work time on it, so that's kind of the deal we have. All right, another question. Over there. Uh, what is the uh, budget for a show? That's, uh, can you please... Uh, how, how much is the uh, budget for the show? Yeah, the budget. <laughs> <laughs> do you mean what, what on the piece of paper that we give to Luby, or do you uh, about the money we spend? The piece of the model, was it? Yeah. Uh, it, it's really hard to say because uh, there's a lot of private money being yeah. spent on things. Uh, uh, I think the official con budget we have for it is, I think, what is it? The, the, officially, the public should. Uh, budget, as I think, including everything, is like four or five thousand. But yeah, plus the stuff we're hiding in the stage budget, basically building a complete puppet stage the size we have. How much would you estimate cost that extra? I would think I would say eight to nine thousand euros worth of equipment that you're basically hiding in the stage budget. It's like, oh, the stage is really expensive this time, um, <laughs> <laughs> but we're not changing the public show uh, uh, budget. And then there are, of course, all the, the, the private material being used that uh, that people never never get the invoice for, like all the, the plastic that TO uses to print the stuff. Like all, sometimes the, the, the little parts are used for building, uh, for building props like, uh, the license for the computer programs. And travel costs. Yeah, travel yeah. costs, yeah. yeah. Yes, fuel. I mean, uh, I told, I, I showed you the route, uh, like the five kilometers. It's a thousand kilometer drive between me and Icebox every time we, we, we make a, a script meeting. And uh, every time we do a rehearsal, basically like like 20 people have to travel that far. They're paying this all on their own expenses. I think if we have, if we had to pay everyone, including Fox and Mojo, what they do, I think you're seeing about, I would say at least, between 50 and 70,000 euros worth of stuff. If we actually had to pay everyone for the hours they do. But it, it's a thing we just love and we're crazy, we kill ourselves. So that, that's how we get away with that kind of budget. And, yeah, and the stuff we reuse from, from the air stage, obviously. Okay, let me see how much time do we have. Uh, I'd say another five minutes. All right, Derek has to run because he's another another event to no, to do. Yeah, replace the batteries. Replace uh, batteries. Nobody understands this anymore. <laughs> you <laughs> All right. Uh, and you, yeah, there's one more question down there. No, it's not a question. More comment. I've yes. Heard you at least six times say we're not professional here. <laughs> it means you're earning money. If you say you're professional, it means you're earning money. Well, it means more than that. You have to say that being professional is supposed to be paid as a professional on two different things. And from what I've seen here, you, you've got the professional spirit, you've got the professional seasoning, you've got all it takes. I, I do not want to hear you anymore say that you're not professional. <laughs> well, thank That's you so much for saying that. You're all it takes. professional. <laughs> And, and we're trying, we're trying hard to be, honestly, because we have to have some discipline to actually make this work. Well, you have succeeded. I love you, professional. Okay, thank you so much. So we're professional, uh, professional puppeteers now. Thank you for the comments. Any more questions? Any more questions? Back there. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, uh, once you create a puppet show, you're obviously a uh, new performer. You're always met with other props that don't really have any other purpose. You know, what do you do with all the leftover props from shows? <laughs> it depends. If it looks really useful, we put it in storage and we use it again. Like if we have like swords or guns or something like that, it's very generic. We basically have a huge inventory of stuff in the storage, and we've we've made photos of everything. We've got a catalog, and uh, some things are just too nice to throw away. Like nobody needs that lights, yeah, or, yeah? For example, the snapshot, or what normally is more interesting, for example, all the panels we are drawing. Also, people always see, yeah, nice, you can maybe can put them somewhere. No, all of them are going to be thrown away. We have trashed pretty much everything off this show. <laughs> yeah, we have, we, have, we have no way to store it, actually, for example, backdrops. We have some, obviously, some, uh, some exceptions to this. For example, the Ringberg Hotel kept some of the year 14 decoration to decorate one of the, uh, the youth club rooms because we used a lot of UV paintings with bats and caves and everything. They basically asked, asked us, can we have this? We said, sure, just just hold it wherever you want. So they have it in the basement now. Some guy actually took a uh, uh, um, took like an electrical saw and, and, and sought out a piece of artwork he wanted to have and stuff like that. So that, that was really funny. Um, and uh, if we really like a piece of equipment, we just take it. Um, we all have some dead puppets in the in the basement, you know. Stones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Some some we just keep as a keepsake. But a lot. Never use them again. But usually, usually at the con, there's a big uh, trash container out there, and I asked someone else to do it because I can't. Or I really can't. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it's hard, but it's you know doing it for the fandom and. Doing it for this thing itself and doing it for the cross public, yeah, that makes it work. Well, there. Yeah, I was wondering if you said you throw a lot of those things away. Uh, did you ever consider uh, having um, um, for additional charity uh, money uh, selling off uh, to some? Because I guess there are people that would love to get a piece of. We did that. We did that with puppets, partially. Uh, Lance sometimes built puppets we used for the show that he sells afterwards, or that he gives to charity. And um, usually try to take everything of them that tells you anything about the story and put them on display. Um, there's not that much thing that you can actually take away that makes any sense. And uh, obviously, many things will give away the story, and we're trying to keep up the uh, we're trying to keep up the. Um, um, Thing, uh, the, the, the suspense and not telling anybody any uh, thing about the. Um and afterwards, there's just no real time to do it. I mean, the convention is basically done. I mean, we're done with the show. I mean, basic afterwards, when you specifically know we can't take this home, it's too big or something like that, uh, that you may ask uh, uh, someone if you would. There is no time. I mean. Afterwards, uh, the TV. No, why? Why before? Going on. If it's obvious that this. If before we can't show it. We can't show it. it uh, yeah, all the charity stuff is done uh, by by the moment we start playing, and uh, especially the large things nobody wants them because nobody has a way of transporting them. It's like you need to be very, very, very dedicated to actually take something like the snap draw home because it's like one meter fifty. <laughs> so, so it's really, it's, it's a really hard sell. Um, so sometimes when we can, we do, but it's, we, we tried in the past, but it really doesn't work. Okay. Um, with your at the charity auction, where will be two of the printed puppet hats uh, that are made. So if you want. One of these hats were for you to grab. Very, very nice. And of course, if, if you like, we, we are putting some of the stuff that, that, that we have designed in 3D are on Thingiverse. So you can actually download the shapes and build your own puppets. And Theo has a, a huge blog, um, uh, I think on LiveJournal, where he has like step-by-step uh, -step pictures of how to build a puppet like that. So if you if you want to give it a try, we have all the instructions online and you can have a look. So uh, Theo is even going to help. You know, If you want a puppet head, you can commission him and he will do it for you. If you want to build us more puppets. If you want to build us more puppets, by the way, you have my address. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. So yeah, okay, let me see. Uh, one final question, then we have to wrap it up. Oh, there. Will there be a power show in year 22? We are planning. Uh, we have a lot of difficult uh, technical questions to solve before we before we can start because we lost the nice rehearsal location and we have to actually design a stage that fits in the budget we have now. 
which is kind of a challenge because we pretty much doubled the stage budget this year, as you can probably guess, because we have like doubled the space. Um, if we work that out, we really want to, yeah. Especially now, after playing this one, it's like, ah, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like coming home, right? Yes, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's amazing. It's a very busy, very cramped, very full home, but yeah. it's home. Yeah. But yeah. We, have, we have to solve the technical problem before we have. We yeah, this show is done. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go for it. And yes, that would be good. Our team shrunk a bit after <laughs> last year, and we basically we might make it work, but the more people we get, like Liam said before, exactly. um, the better it would, or the better the chances for a show next year, because yeah. it's just a crap load amount of work, and um, with as few people as we are right now, it's really hard to do. So, so we offer no pay, we offer back pain and stuff. So <laughs> yeah, so we'll have to pull many all nighters, but you'll have some great team spirit and free food. We <laughs> <laughs> offer <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're happy with people that help make the bills one or two or three props. Yeah, yeah. that's good as well. Yeah. So it, it depends on what, what your skills are, what you like to do. So if you want to be on the stage with us, then prepare for a lot of hours of really, really pain. No, yeah, it can't, no. yeah. it's going to be horrible. Can't, can't it's going to be horrible. It is rewarding. It yes, is rewarding it is. At the end. Um, uh, we we need people building stuff. We need people coming to the uh, to the backdrop weekend and just painting stuff. If you say, okay, I'm not an artist, I can't paint. You're wrong, really. There are artists around to stick a, a, a brush into your into your hand, put some paint on it, and tell you put that paint on there. You can just go like this. Put it on there. Well, you'll be surprised what your talents are. We had some new yeah, arrivals so. here that basically told us, oh, I can't do anything, I don't know how to do this. And then uh, we went like, oh, we're running out of time, someone has to paint those pens. Oh, yeah, I can't do this, but I will try anyway. And, uh, well, yeah, I know I'm talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> and that is one of the best presents we ever had. We're like, why didn't you tell us you could do it? I didn't know I could do this. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, sometimes you'd be surprised what you can do if, if you have a challenge. So, yeah. Do you think about the backstage work? You shouldn't be afraid of body contact. Oh yeah, you're going yeah. to be very touchy <laughs> feely back there. So you're all going in like hanging one sweaty oh, pile and. Yeah. <laughs> we are How many people for the, for the mine scene years ago? We had oh table. right, yes, for the uh, with the lorry. <laughs> yeah, we did five people on that puppet players. That's possible. Yes, it works. Really tight. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we originally wanted to put like a that's the scroll on here Prime that tells you how much the events are delayed. And basically, put in like the pop show has been delayed 365 days, and uh, or 66 exactly. <laughs> So we hope we are we are going to be back next year and have a show. Um, if my personal health allows it, if the technical problems allow it, if we can do it, we will probably have. Okay, um, we need to clear this room. So I would suggest if you want to have some hands up with the public, some of the publishers should just so put them outside. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. The, because the, 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 the lobby is uh, basically unused. So uh, if you want to have some time with the puppets and the puppeteers, we're just going to take the puppets out the door and uh, give you an opportunity to see them. And thanks a lot for coming, and uh, hopefully seeing you next year. Hmm? Uh, <laughs> All right. Put it through, boss. Mit mit Kompetenz am besten, mit der Zeit. Thank you for coming! Thank you! Oh mein Gott.